24. I'm one of your hosts, soon hopefully to be not the only host today, Lauren Gray. Um, we have an amazing list of things to talk about today. One of our compatriots in crime, Mr. Robert Cole, who uh, is a uh, worker of Focus Right, among other prestigious organizations like J.D. Power and so forth. He'll name drop as soon as he gets here. Give us a great list of uh, topics today. It's actually going to be hard to fit most of this stuff in. And if I'm by myself, I'll probably do it because I'll just breeze right through them. But I hope as I get other co-hosts joining me that we will dialogue a little bit about the amazing uh, content that he gave us today. I'm making sure that we are simulcasting on everything. So we should be live and doing well for everything. All right. Facebook, YouTube, uh, Twitter, and LinkedIn. So if you're seeing us on LinkedIn as well, if you'd like to join the show live, you can go to bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash H-T-M show 224. And then you'll join our audience here on the chat that we have. And then if you want to join, if we have an empty seat, which right now we have five empty seats, uh, then you can do so. Or you can just get dialogue with us in the chat. I will try to keep an eye out for uh, our chat respondents on um, all of our other platforms as well as we go along through this. So some of the great topics that uh, Robert has given us, uh, one of his headliners today was, of course, the Focus Right uh, Conference Center. One thing about Focus Right, for those who may have ever not attended it, it is a who's who. Uh, literally, you can rub shoulders with all the leaders of the industries. Um, but as, as Robert points out, ironically, uh, airlines and uh, such, they don't tend to represent very well rental car companies and so forth. But it's a great tech one. A lot of new and emerging technologies come out of most every major tech platform that we use today uh, goes there to parade their wares, so to speak, to uh, get into a contest to make sure that uh, they provide themselves uh, the opportunity to expose their product to uh, the industry leaders. And um, it's a great thing for that. But one thing that they do that is really remarkably uh, great is if you can't attend, hello. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Miss Lou Mockman. How are you today? Doing well. How are you? I am doing well. Thank you for the company. I, I was I was being to talk to myself. I said, self, I says. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I was giving Robert a compliment. The list he sent out was very robust. I, I, there's great topics on every subject line. Um, it's going to be hard to kind of hit all of them. I was just referring to the focus right. Uh, one of the great things that they do about focus right is that if you can't attend, because it's wickedly expensive, it's uh, I think forty seven hundred dollars to attend. But uh, that's mainly for networking capabilities, because you really do get to sit side by side with some um, uh, all the industry leaders. But what they do nicely is that they take all of their content and live stream it for free. So it gives you a great chance to really watch what's being done in the sense of emerging technologies and uh, open dialogues. Um, Robert is a uh, employee of focus right he's a producer and data analyst and so forth and uh he actually gets to interview a lot of these people and go through a lot of the uh, content selections and so forth and he made some great recommendations we'll leave those in the show notes as to which videos that he would recommend to watch first compared to the others uh and some of the great highlights he puts he sends out a list uh of, that we're referring to to the digital oh, excuse me it's no longer the digital marketing board it's the marketing board of hsmai and uh he in that context of the letter that he sends out uh, made some interesting comments about some of the highlighted statements that some people made, some of the um, tit-for-tat comments and so forth of uh, industry leaders talking about each other. I thought the one between uh, the uh, founder of Oyo and um, uh, what was it, TripAdvisor was an interesting dig. But like I said, those will be in the show notes. We'll make sure that they're there. But with that being said, some of the other topics I thought were really uh, impressive on all of this um, well, gosh, it's like almost picking out of a hat. All of them are the same. Um, I want to get to the one about checking and checking out anytime uh, because Lily, you being the revenue uh, management specialist of our our happy eclectic group, I'd love to see your your insights as to what you feel is the pros and cons of the, according to the article, a trend development of people being able to uh, uh, leverage their arrival and departure times associated with a hotel, whether to monetize it or not. Uh, so love to hit that one. Um, love to talk about the connected trip, which is the uh, the magical unicorn idea that we can put uh, all the dots together now between hotel reservations, flight reservations, recancellations and rebookings, check-ins, travel transportations to places all seamlessly done for us without us having to go through the arduous process of connecting the dots ourselves. Uh, so that'll be kind of fun to be able to hit that one as well. 
And then uh, the other revenue management one, which I think would be interesting, is the uh, concept of, of hospitality staying open in the race to the bottom. The eye for travel conversation about how, uh, in the rider's perspective, um, everybody's going to homogenize their rate, and it's really the same rate everywhere, and we're all just going to be at the bottom of that because we're going to always have to offer the lowest rate available for all that. Um, why are we getting duplicities of Roberts? Robert, you can't clone yourself, man. The sheep thing didn't work. <laughs> I'll try to figure that. I'll be right back, maybe only once. <laughs> we do. They did it with sheep, and that's as far as they want to go. So, I Lily, know. with that said, there's a bunch of others. Which ones did you find that you, when you cruised through, did, was there any other ones other than that that you thought were worthy of starting the conversation with? Well, there were a lot of really good articles, like you said. So, I'm kind of interested in all of them. Definitely, you hit on two that are of special interest to me. Uh, on the revenue management side and interested to hear your thoughts as well on the Google article in particular. Uh, the squeeze? Yes. The yes. Squeeze. yes. Yes. And and I, I do want to throw in, even though it's not a topic that Robert had thrown into this, uh, BERT is turning into a very dominant conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, not from Sesame Street, but BERT as in the... <laughs> The, what, what people are saying is probably the largest uh, update to Google in the past five years mm -hmm. as to what, what the impact of what's going to happen. And a lot of big players, TripAdvisor, Expedia, they actually got hurt by BERT <laughs> in their rankings and listings because of their data le level profile. But yes. OK, so um, out of the hat, which one you want to grab? Because if, if, I think Robert's having technical duplicity issues. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we have to wait for Robert to come back before we can talk about the uh, check-in because, you know, we argued about that last week. So I want Every him to be I here know. to, you know, state his case. Uh, <laughs> while he's gone. It's okay. We can bash him while he's not here. He, it's fine. <laughs> hey, Mr. Butler. hey, guys. How's everyone? Hello. Well, how are you? Hello. I'm doing good. We were just ready to dive into Life Center Meetings, Cosmic Realities, and explain the universe in less than 20 minutes. You in? Awesome. Let's go. <laughs> string theory. Oh, yeah. Let's do some string theory first and a little quantum yeah, yeah. right after that. There you go. <laughs> All right. Sorry. Just geeky. <laughs> shall, we, uh, shall we start with the race to the bottom from I for Travel? Sure. Sure. I'll put the link up and we can begin the discussion. Go right ahead. So I did think that this was very interesting. You know, we have this whole Marriott and Expedia thing going on with distributing wholesale rates. And the fact that those are making their way into the corporate booking tool, I'm pretty sure that was this article that it was talking about this, is definitely something that hoteliers should be concerned about because we can't easily access or shop corporate booking tools which means it's very difficult for us then to manage the parity and the display of these rates. And a lot of people are still doing these static rates with wholesalers that are significantly under what they would do elsewhere. So the idea, of course, being that they're supposed to be packaged with other things. But I highly doubt that on the corporate booking tools that that's happening um, with any regularity. So that definitely opens a lot of things up to interpretation and the additional danger. Hey, Tim. Hey, good to be here. Hey, Tim. Um, the additional danger that I see there is that because it's being distributed through Expedia in this case, right into the corporate booking tool, there is no opportunity necessarily for hoteliers midstream to renegotiate their contracts. Right. Because they're technically already on the contract with the wholesalers and already with Expedia and nobody foresaw the need to put in language that says the wholesaler can't distribute it via Expedia to a corporate booking tool. So it's kind of wide open right now that can cause a lot of problems for hoteliers. And I, I think that we're going to need to be really savvy about how to get kind of snapshots, find your friends in the industry who are able to view the corporate booking tools that can give you an idea of what's being displayed um, and also very carefully scrub your agreements and make it known to the entities that you're working with that you won't stand for that type of redistribution. I'm going to quote Mr. Tim Peter, who just joined us, uh, something that he pointed out. Uh, by the way, wonderful backdrop, Mr. Tim. It looks like you're enjoying a mountain uh, vista view something or other. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is actually my kitchen. Um, I am uh, uh, having a little work done downstairs in our house, which is where my office is and the background noise is. Uh, well, thank you for joining me. So I'm 
I'm not, you have I'm, a not <laughs> I'm not normally in this space. It's actually not the most productive space that there's great lighting, but at the wrong side. So like I'm backlit, which is. No, you're doing pretty good. You don't look like you're in the witness, witness protection program at all. You kind of look like first. I mean, you got a little Lex Luthor thing going on, but I mean, other than that, you're looking fine. <laughs> <laughs> So you were to quote me, Lauren. I'm dying to hear what I'm going to quote you. Okay, so a couple of years ago, you made this wonderful, and you were very adamant about this, and in fact, the whole show was talking about contract negotiations with OTAs and contract negotiations with wholesalers is one of the most paramount things that are ignored by most hoteliers as a standardization of their, of their other program. And you were talking about the fact that we miss this window of opportunity persistently that we re-sign or, or automatically renew things without going back in and tearing apart the contract relationship to make sure that little loopholes like this can possibly be closed. Well, and it's especially problematic. I mean, you know, I think the brands do a very good job of negotiating the contracts, you know, in general terms. Um, it's a, it's especially a problem for independent. Well, I mean, yeah, there's always loopholes. There's always the things nobody thought to think about, right? But at the same time, the real problem is is for independents who don't have a lot of leverage to actually negotiate terms, right? I mean, the contract is, sorry, that's our standard agreement. You can either sign or you can not be on the specific platform. And those are those are where you find yourself in some real trouble um, if you're an independent property. Um, yeah, you know what's interesting about that, though, Tim? We, a couple of years ago, we were really big into looking at the legal... Um, pushback that was available for OTAs bidding yeah. on brands and showing ads on brand keywords on Google. So we, we were working with a lawyer through an organization called Opma that I work with who had won a big case mm -hmm. against off-site rental companies. And we just went through the exercise of reading contracts from Expedia and Booking for independent hotels. And we were surprised to find how different they were. You know, and, and a lot of it was unbeknownst oh. to the independent hotels. Yeah, but yeah. There, there was all kinds of nuance in every single one. No two contracts were the same. So there's definitely felt like some flexibility, but they're they're always going to try to take the maximum advantage of the independent hotel. Uh, you know, understanding that they're probably not going to read every every little point within the contract, but. It, it definitely warrants you taking more time to read through it and having some legal expertise, look at it, review it, and yeah. give you their opinion as well. Well, there are two there are two aspects, though. One is the legal side, and then the other is truly the operational and the distribution side to really know how this stuff works, right? Because um, if you don't know that, I mean, I'm not sure, sorry, I was late coming in, but you are talking about the bundling side of doing sequential um, yeah. But now doing the um, the distribution of wholesale, wholesale rates, rates yeah. getting it into the corporate booking tools. Oh, sure. Yeah. The yeah. Yeah. The yeah. Okay. Yeah. So either either sending them to a different channel or a very common one now is yes, it needs to be sold um, in a package. Well, what is a package? Package isn't defined. A lot of hotels assume, or hotel brands assume, that's a simultaneous prepaid, non refundable, non cancel, and if, if it isn't stated, it can be anything. So they book the air, and then on the confirmation email, they send back, oh, would you like fries with that? And <laughs> there's your hotel, and there's the pricing, and it's lower than your price. And there's nothing you can do. You have no legal right recourse. Like, where, where are we forbidden to do that, right? So that's happening like, like crazy. Same thing with opaque stuff, where it's supposed to be opaque, the property's not identifiable. Does that mean that they can post TripAdvisor, um, not just the numbers of circles and things like that, but the exact number of reviews. No, you need to have a term that says that the property is unidentifiable, right? And then, and you'll see there are some that don't have those. So those are the ones who either have better lawyers or smarter distribution people. Um, yeah. yeah so. so I'm going to defend the brands, or at least one brand on this, for very specific and very self-serving reasons. I am married to somebody who actually negotiates this, these agreements on behalf of Wyndham, so I am confident they are ironclad, because she's really great at achieving that. She's standing right behind you with a gun. She, she isn't, but she may watch the show later, and yeah, okay. so we need to make sure that I'm completely clean on this. I have no con I have no doubt in my mind that Wyndham's contract is negotiated. Right. You so, know, I don't know about you guys, but I think we should start a drinking game every time Tim mentions Wyndham. Well, it's oh, only we have bingo cards. <laughs> we have bingo. Oh, we, we have bingo cards. cards. We do have bingo oh, perfect. Cards. <laughs> no. No. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Okay. Now, now we need to ask Lily. But are I, there I any particular there. bingo <laughs> items for me since you've been on the show? Oh, Ooh, that's no, no, no hints. 
no hints. If she doesn't come up with any, you guys have to stop giving this. I, I think you've been light on it the last couple. Yeah, you've been of light. You've been courteous. Yeah. And, and really, for for clarity, think I, I often in the context of the mood accuse myself since this trod very directly into my wife world. I'm I'm not making <laughs> it so much as I'm mentioning my marriage and how I like keeping it happy. <laughs> there well, no, there's no George and Kellyanne Conway action happening. You know? right. Having having yeah. negotiated a contract with with Tammy once before, horrible strategic error. I mean, when things really get tough, we normally take a hostage. We took Tim hostage. That didn't work. At yeah, all. She, was like, she was like, "That's actually improved the contract." She was, she was like, "Right." She was like, like "Thank you." Do I have you. to keep it? Yes, right. <laughs> oh man! So, Robert, I don't know. For you, I, I can't say that it's a specific word. I yes. only yes. take oh, note that you like oh, to yeah. argue the opposite side of a point. The Venmo, the Venmo is coming right at you. That's good. Oh, <laughs> Thank you, Lily. <laughs> <this> <laughs> You will see. Learn. Learn. You, will, learn. you will learn. You will find. Yeah, out. yeah. yeah. You, you'll you'll hear the word Cornell. You'll hear the word uh, Four Seasons. Um, let's see what other fun things. Well, JD Powers gets tossed around a little bit more than he used to be. Um, uh, what's what's? I can never remember the name of it. It's, it's a shame because I've only heard it like thirty times. But what was it called? Like Great Escape or Run Away or whatever it was called. The the economy brand you worked with up in Canada. Oh, 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 Journey's End. Journey's, Journey's End. End. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Dead, dead guy in a box. Um, and then, well, hey. And then hey, you want, and then you want was... a half hour to blink by? Talk about um, uh, uh, identified inventory by sequential numbers or um, uh, a universal ID number for most hotels. In the, the, oh, the universal right. hospitality identifier. Yes, <laughs> right. that would be very nice. So now I'm curious. Dynamic pricing is another half dynamic hour. Dynamic pricing. That's, that's a tough one, though. Can dynamic pricing really count? Because how do you discuss you know, topics without dynamic pricing coming into the mix? Oh, but, but you, you, you'll see Robert's from the origin of the dynamic pricing model. He will tell you the beginning when the stone cattle was first brought down from the mountain. <laughs> it's, 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 yeah, yeah. it's not the term, Lily. It's the the history lesson. It's the history I lesson. Oh, gotcha, <laughs> gotcha. I'm with you now. Do Let I me have tell you when they Am created... I on the bingo cards yet? We, huh? you know, we have to, we have to be clear. You have to remember, Robert is much, 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 much older than anyone else on the show. I mean, a lot, like really, really. One hundred and seventy-eight. <laughs> You're looking good, Robert. He was there when he overbooked yeah. Bethlehem. Okay, he still exactly. never lived that down. <laughs> I was the guy. I was the guy who walked those guys. Hey, they didn't have a prepaid deposit. <laughs> oh, one, one story. One point on that. Okay, so um, Glenn Fogel, CEO of Booking Holdings, pretty prominent guy in the hotel industry, um, is staying at, and I will name the property because he shellacked them on stage for about 15 minutes. Oh, wow. The, the Hil Curio by Hilton Diplomat Hotel in Hollywood Beach. Oh, no, no, no. The old West. So, Focus Right, since I do work for them, I do know the inside scoop. They had a list of Another VIPs are, right? who are, yes, exactly, who on the do not walk, yeah, you know, VIPs, these are the guys. So, he comes in late at night, I don't know, it was maybe 9 or 10 o'clock, comes up goes hi yeah i'm glenn that sort of thing they go oh i'm i'm very sorry we don't have a room for you and he's like oh it's you know it's being paid for by the group i'm you know an invited speaker and, that's sort of, and they're like no we got we got nothing sort of thing and so I'm like oh um and who walks up behind him is rob torres from google right so um they kind of go and they did have a room but it was for rob <laughs> <laughs> and so Rob kind of you know, offered it to them. And then they eventually did find a room for Glenn. So they were just flat out bald faced lying to him. So, yeah, you know, classic term. I, I talked to Glenn afterward. I, I told him the term is hospitality, right? That is, that is what that is. It's inept. It's inept management. It's bad processes. It's not. I, I mean, even in over, you know, over booking situations. Come on. I was a room division manager. This is rarely on my bingo card. Yellowstone National Park. <laughs> a long oh, time. Come on, that's up there. Yeah, I, I, I have that's, mentioned. That's, that's, I have don't talk about the Austin Hotel. Either. Either. No, don't no, talk about the Austin but, Hotel. Either. But any any rooms division manager, front office manager who wants to complain, six hundred units, uh, room rack manual, 
uh, posting machines, we're talking World War II era, battleship gray, large things, No, none of this cash register stuff, and a 1.08 day length of stay. So, and, and running pretty much structurally full for 90 days. Yeah, so overbooking, you need to anticipate the problem <laughs> and then have processes when they go into effect so you are, know the solution when it happens, it shouldn't be we have to figure this out. It's like, we know this is going to happen, and here's what we are doing. And Fogel did make some really good points, although he did go on much too long, I think, to avoid talking about a bunch of other topics. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, good strategy. It was an excellent strategy. Let's give but, the dip credit here. But, I, I'm, I'm sorry for cutting you off, but let's give the dip credit because it shows that they're really paying attention to what's going on in the industry. That if they decided which you know oh, yeah. mega mega channel to piss off, the correct name was Booking.com, <laughs> not Google. Not Google, yeah, well, <laughs> right. And, and Fogel, Fogel said, you know, he's insulated from that. That never happens to him, right? And he, you know, he hears about it happening every once in a while, sure. and especially the hoteliers who, because it's booked through an OTA, treat you know their guests as sure. second. But boy, let me tell you, I bet he was like, you know, it happened to me, and I can only imagine what. Yeah, you know, goes on with if these guests. Told him He's going to be he, all over. It. If only they told him he should have booked direct, and and they ah. would have avoided the problem. That would have been great. We we actually used to have that's, this very well, real that's problem. The thing we had. It was booked through the group. I know. This was a very real problem we had uh, at leading um, for the executive team, and yeah, that probably belongs to my bingo card. But uh, um, this was a very real problem. We we as execs, every time we stayed at one of our hotels were supposed to write a post, you know, stay report of did, did the property live up to the brand standards and things along those lines. Um, and the number of times when I arrived to the front door of the hotel in a taxi, and this is the key, right? In a taxi, had the doorman open the, had the bellman open the door to the taxi and say, welcome, Mr. Peter, right? Because almost all of us on the senior team were marked people you know like mm -hmm. there were photos of us at all the places we were known um when our reservation was on the books and we're pretty sure we got you know we expect every guest got really good treatment but those were the cases where we worried we were getting different treatment than what the regular guest was getting because mm -hmm. they sure were. When we walked through the door sure. sure well okay one one note on that that's because tim had a full a full both a front and a, and a profile, and Interpol had it, and it was imposing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so to wrap up, going backwards, first off, Robert, we were giving you a compliment that the list that you gave out today was exceptionally excellent. I mean, there's some really great topics into it today. Um, and to wrap up on the first point of this, as opposed thing, to the regular week, which is just total crap, which is just yeah. crap. Yeah, just like you know, whatever you know, if you're something together, some glue and paste and whatever. But no, the. Uh, what just to conclude the first topic that we had about this on this this contract rate and so forth, other than negotiations of the contract when that that time is due, what are other steps that can be done to, to somehow mitigate this leakage of these rates or this usability into third parties for the for the corporate travelers because they give some pretty rough numbers that forty percent of corporate travel is going outside of the out of their out of their rate blocks and going into oh absolutely so oh yeah but what are some yeah. other things and I'm looking to really want to say this is like can we mitigate now uh, to try to stem some of that bleeding? Is there anything you've done successfully or that it's just a bleed that's there and we have to chase down when they, they, they break ranks? All of these are based on how you can have mutual wins between both parties. I mean, that is the bottom line. The corporate trial managers, they want compliance, right? Because they have all these duty of care issues. If something really yeah. goes bad, Right in a in a destination, they've got to figure out where are these people, what's going on, and they booked outside a policy or something that may create a problem, right? I mean, maybe it won't. Yeah, maybe they they booked through however, and some of these some of these companies are now giving yeah, the employees enough flexibility the where they're saying, yeah, you're getting yeah. you're getting two hundred you get two hundred dollars a night, but you get two hundred bucks a night, and if you want to go stay at some place, you know, you get a hot wire thing for one ten you keep the difference or whatever, um, that's okay, but it creates this other thing on duty of care, right, which is which is mm -hmm. tough. So anything you can do to where you're helping them, a 
accomplish what they're trying to do. And then you can talk about the financial terms and go, okay, here's what we really you know need to have happen and how you're stacked up against the, the competitors. And like, hey, you know, we're giving you such and such, especially in the corporate market, right? You can talk to them about your upgrading policy. No, what we do at this rate, you're right. You may be able to get a five dollars, you know, less at the hotel next door because they will always give five dollars less. That is their strategy, <laughs> no matter what. But when we're closed yeah, or whatever, we will. If we have an available room, we will upgrade your executives, or we'll do whatever to make things. You know, what do you guys need? What works for you? And. And sometimes that works. Sometimes it won't. Some people are just, you know, they'll hammer on the lowest rate or they'll be jerks or whatever. But no, those those processes generally work and help on renegotiation tact with them. And, hey, what's going on? Hey, we aren't seeing as many rooms as you thought or, you know, anything we can do to help that. Or, you know, and you can. You can do things in the middle of the year going, hey, we can start doing some things to whatever. Hey, you guys seem to have training groups in here once a month. Maybe we could go do something with them, make something a little bit yeah better. So, whatever. Yeah, and I think too, like a lot of this comes back to the data cleanliness topic that we talked about. Because, in theory, what I'd like to say is, at check-in, have your front desk agents ask all of your guests, you know, do you have a business card that I can use to enter your information instead of just an ID? Because then you can enter the company name, and if it's a company that you've negotiated with, but the booking came through an OTA or through a wholesale rate, you can more easily identify things that are off there. Um, but I, we're still trying to get them to check IDs at all or AAA cards, so adding a step probably is not realistic. But in a perfect world, that's what I'd love to see is, you know, companies being able to motivate their front office agents to get all of the data, make sure it's entered correctly, connect the guests, you know, stay to their profile so that we can get a history on the guest. All of those things are super important. And until we crack the code and how we can get the front office to participate in things like that, I think that there's always going to be some limitations. Robots, that's the answer. Just replace all front, right. front desk staff with robots. They'll be fallible. <laughs> infallible. For sure. I, I'm thinking more dinosaurs, um, like a tyrannosaurus, you know. Robot. Yeah, well, they did that. They it's always have them, right? Right? Right. 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 right All right. Robert, to that end, there was another the topic. The microphone is off, Robert. Oh, good. I mean, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping he wouldn't notice. Okay. <laughs> Who muted me? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no, I was going to say if you book if you book online the number of hotels who do not give or they don't want your frequent guest number, right? Because you don't qualify for points or whatever, you want their frequent guest number so you can start going, gee, Tim's you know, books through booking, you know, a third of the time, hotwire a third of the time, uh, his corporate rate a third of the you know, whatever the case may be. Right. That's really really important information and so many of them just and again the diplomat messed up stuff for me i'm a hilton honors member i have the app for some reason they sent me a text message that said hey give us your email address so we can send you your folio right i'm kind, right. Of, kind of like oh okay and i thought well gee it's part of the focus right block but they had my you know i, I don't know i'm using the app i i didn't understand so, and i actually got two of those emails so i did i you know, i replied back it's like and i gave my focus right email address right so that's fine i never got the folio the next morning and it's just like what are you guys do this makes sense so then i sent it and then and there's a text string right with me and i don't know what they're doing to manage on the other side but i get the text it goes oh What's your email address? Is it Rock Cheetah one? And it's, or no, no, he didn't even ask that. He said, what is your email address? And it's like, you have two of them. They're in the, I mean, just, I don't know who manages that hotel, but they're doing a shitty job. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> well, guys. It, you, it, it deserves better. And the hotel's for sale. The hotel's for sale for a million bucks a key for a billion bucks. Right. Yeah. So oh, come on, guys, job. you got to do better than this. Yeah. OK, so one of the other topics we definitely didn't want to miss was the um, flexibility check in, check out the article associated with come in, come out whenever you want to. 
Uh, how is that? Is that a positive thing, a good thing? Is it a monetization thing, or is it a loyalty thing? Um, and it was. A, I'll put the article link up for it. Um, it was just a, one of the other good articles Mr. Robert put together for us today. Um, hey, Robert. Robert, can you mute when you're not talking? The background noise in your uh, Marie calendars is. Or, or just turn around until I want to hush. Yeah, so be that, be yeah. That or just tell everyone else to shut the hell just up. Just tell everyone yeah. to bugger off. No. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So, what, what do you think? I mean, uh, the, the article basically says that there are hotels, and I didn't know about this platform, the Hotel Flex, that um, is a, a program that is trying to optimize hotels to be able to do this based on their focus of whether they want, they want to uh, monetize it or whether they want to create a loyalty value to it. I didn't know that that platform even existed, and I thought it was kind of interesting that it was out there. I, I, I somewhat wonder if this uh, article, not not to not to derail the conversation, but I somewhat huh? wonder if this article was pitched by. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or, yeah you always have to bring us all these sorry. This is pretty really a little. It's a yeah, concept right. of it, not Tenor. the article itself. It's a concept. No, no, sure, sure, sure. You know, yeah. it's yeah. just something that should be considered this, beyond this. We talked about this a week ago or two. Right. Yeah, we did. It's it's a great idea, right? There's a there's In an theory. Out- Right. In theory, it's a great idea. In th- it, as with all things, execution yeah. matters. Yeah. Right? right. Specific execution matters. There's a great value to be had there, and for some for some properties, for some brands, it's going to make a lot of sense to say we're going to we're going to charge people for that value. For some properties, for some brands, it's going to be you know worthwhile to say, hey, we want to build loyalty, and this is a value add that we give to our. So I'm gonna I'm gonna shift this slightly to a conversation we've had lots of times about loyalty and the fact that so many loyalty programs in the industry are rewards programs instead of recognition programs, right? Mm -hmm. And this is a great way to recognize truly loyal guests and give them a value add without necessarily billing for it, but hopefully increasing the customer lifetime value by incentivizing them for being loyal and for coming back to see you again and again. But a a lot of this is just going to come down to execution. I'm in favor of more hotels making this more available as long as you make the, you know, the operation side of it work correctly. It's aligned with what your brand value is. But my fear fear is people are going to take this the the way they have, you know, things like messaging, uh, real-time messaging by SMS on on property. And and it's great in theory. It improves the guest experience, (laughs) adds a lot of value to the the entire process. But in 99% of cases, it is executed so poorly that it creates friction that wasn't there. And you end up having a detrimental effect. And that yeah. that's my fear. So you've really got to think through the why, think through yep. a whole strategy, think through the implementation, make sure you train people properly, and then set appropriate expectations. Because the reality is, even if you set this up in, in the best case scenario, and the way they, they described it is there's a 72 hour window where you find out whether or not it's available, or you have to notify them within 72 hours. But there's going to be times when, you know, I may have stayed with the property 10 times and I was able to get the, you know, the late checkout at at 5 p.m. And then on the 11th time, I can't. And now all of a sudden, you've just eroded all of the the positive sentiment you created in me. And now I'm pissed. And I wouldn't have been pissed if if it hadn't been a thing. So I think you've got to really set expectations and and, and handle the communication and the execution of, of how it's delivered really, really, really well. I yeah. think that's right. Nice. And the exception the exception handling is very tough because especially yeah. if you're charging for it, hey, my flight was delayed three hours. Right. No, they don't want to right. they, yeah. I'm sorry, you're going to pay for that. That that's one or the same thing with delays. Um, the whole flow of how these guests I mean, going, yes, you can get it kind of reserved up, but you know, one of the comments in there was yes, we put housekeeping coming in on hourly shifts around the clock and you go, mm-hmm. Oh, that's not going to work. Yeah. 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 You, know, you need to have the housekeepers when the demand is. And again, if you're having problems getting your VIPs a room when they, you know, when they come in, this is not a program for you. <laughs> well, going back to, there was a platform that was out there that was trying to do short stay stuff. And I can't remember the name of it. I think it died uh, where you have a long haul flights. You're coming in or you're leaving and you, and you can basically do like a few hours at a hotel. Mm-hmm. Uh, and 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 and, do, and there was a the, the complexity of that being something of of your regular check ins versus the usability of short term and stuff. The Lincoln Motel has been doing that for decades, technically. You know, right by yeah, it. yeah. But uh, you know, <laughs> it, 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 but then the inverse. I keep, I keep thinking of Robert's story when he was in New York and they went over and he came in uh, early enough that he was trying to get the room and then they wanted to bang him for seventy dollars, which was more than the room rate. 
to check in a couple hours early. And it's like, talk about a, a rubber band effect of despising the place at that point. Oh, no, that was that, that was after making having me wait from 10 a.m. until noon for the hotel room to be cleaned and then to pay $70 to check in at noon instead of the 3 p.m. check in time when the room was now available. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that they was. Did, a, that they was put, they put salt on the moon. Not cutting it twice. <laughs> yeah, that was I a, thought it was. I thought it was interesting with the standard because they're making it five percent of the room, right? So at least in that case, it yeah. avoids you know having it be more than the room rate. I mean, five percent right. though. I wonder about the effect of goodwill versus the rate because if their typical rate is say one hundred and fifty dollars. You're talking about making seven bucks, right? Yeah. You know what's that? Just to me, it's almost too low then, because then oh, it yeah, feels like sure. nickeling and diming more. So I feel yeah. like anything, you know, yeah. anything yeah. below twenty dollars, the guest is like really. Yeah. Rental yeah. car industry standards. Really. Rental car yeah. industry standards were always originally to give you an hour window right to okay if you're an hour late that's okay now that's been squeezed like 30 minutes and they they've got stopwatches it's pretty pretty um, bold about it now but if you go over that additional hour is one third of the daily rental yeah yeah right? if it's so they do that they, and then you have two hours it. yeah is the second hour is the third the third hour you got the car for another day can we yeah, not yeah. emulate the rental car industry? Like somebody needs to crack the code on yeah. why it takes me twenty minutes to get the rental well, car. So wait, attribute based pricing. I mean, hey, do you oh, want God. to be in the room? That's um, going to be an extra that's dollar. That's something card, right? Like a, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so I'm, I want to come at this from a slightly different angle, and I'm gonna, I'm probably gonna, you know. Uh, uh, Press of you know trigger Lily right because I'm going to come at this from a completely different Perfect. perspective, the non-revenue perspective and more the brand perspective. There's a very famous study they did in um, um, child care. Uh, I was going to bring this one up. It's great. I love it. It's a great study. It's a great study where um, they had a problem. Uh, uh, somebody did a study where they discovered you know child care centers have a problem with parents picking up kids late. Uh, it inconveniences the staff. It, it, you know, they have to pay overtime. Uh, uh, the 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 childcare facility has to pay overtime. Things along those lines. And so, what they had done for a long time was they they basically you know guilted the parents into you know hey come pick up your damn kids <laughs> on time because you're inconveniencing people. And what they did instead was they ran the study and it, it looked like it was well coordinated and everything. You know, they ran at a couple different facilities, double blind kind of stuff. Um, but what they did was they started charging a fee and it was, you know, 10 bucks for every five minutes you were late or something like that. I don't remember what the fee was. And what they discovered was that parents started picking up their kids on average later <clears throat> because they'd gone from a social contract of, hey, I'm going to pick up my kid because I don't want to inconvenience the people who take care of them all day, to a service they were being offered. Yep. <laughs> and I can simply pay more and get a service. And so I think there's a question you want to ask. And, you know, it, it absolutely gets to uh, Stort's point about, um, about uh, um, how you execute. But I also think there's a, a brand value prop. And, and what are you saying about your brand you know, if you're nickel and diming them or things along those lines, there are hotels I would absolutely pay for this, and I would be thrilled to, to have it. Uh, right? I'm, I, I'm going to do the focus group of one thing. That's a bingo card item for me, probably. Um, <laughs> not suggesting that I'm representative of all travelers by any stretch, but I'm certainly representative of certain type of traveler where I travel a lot on business. I often arrive early in the day you know, because I'm on an early flight or things like that. But the thing that I have to do may not start until the afternoon or the evening. And I would love an early check-in so I can go to my room and work or I can go to my room and change my clothes or things along those lines before I have to go to a dinner. By, um, by work, you mean nap. But you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I do some of my best my best thinking prone. Um, <laughs> um, With a mini bar nearby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, but, you know, 
for those trips, for that kind of trip, I would absolutely pay extra for that. You know, if I'm traveling internationally with my family and we mm-hmm. I go on an overnight flight, I absolutely would pay extra for it. So we go get a little rest before we go do whatever we're going to do. But, you know, if I happen to uh, be taking a weekend holiday or something along those lines and I arrive in town early and stuff, we'll just park the car and wander around town. We don't care. And I wouldn't pay extra for it. So I think there are certain types of properties where it works better to say we're going to charge for this from a brand value proposition perspective. And I think there are certain types of properties where it's going to work less well yeah. from a brand value proposition perspective. And I think you need to think about that, too. And, and going I'll, back to your point of the, the daycare scenario, you, you don't want to create this as the normal behavior for the majority of people. Because it's right. right. logistically going to create a lot of challenges that don't exist today. It's already tough to turn around rooms. And, and we debated a, a couple of weeks ago about how if you could stagger that, maybe it alleviates some of the demand for, for housekeeping and, and so but I really think if you if you end up squeezing everyone in the hotel for an extra three, four, five, ten hours, you just you, you're creating a really bad situation do in we, terms of the quality of the product. Do we start first hand arrival time? You know, if you arrive at eleven a.m., you pay a hundred dollars. If you arrive yeah. at one p.m., you pay ninety dollars. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. It, I mean, it could be in per convince. hour, right? It's yeah. however yeah. early, yeah, something like that. This is something I couldn't convince my New York clientele to do, and I did this in Melbourne, Florida, when I was GM of a, a Hilton Airport down uh, down there. Was um, there are certain flights that come in from certain destinations at certain times persistently. Uh, it's for like one of your hometowns in New Guinea. Uh, Stuart, you know, they fly in a certain time every year. <laughs> That's like a reverse bingo. Like, it's not me saying something. <laughs> right. You guys are saying it to me. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, there was a funny thing. Anyway, anyway, before, we, before we ever wrap this show, Stuart, I'm determined to hear you say, dingoes ate my baby. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe over a beer. I don't think I got over a beer. Right. So, right. so, so anyway, this flight always came in from London at a certain time of the day, and it was always earlier than we had room availability for so what we started doing was uh, when we started taking reservations, we started getting London addresses, obviously, in part of the, their portfolio. We started pulling a separate list from those. And we reached out to them and said, look, um, more often than not, the rooms, if, if it's available to you, we will do an early check-in for you if, it, if the room is available. But in you know, certain circumstances or not, we would invite you to – we're going to leave our restaurant open, and we have a lobby bar also. And we'd like to offer you a complimentary lunch. And uh, first cocktail just to chill. We'll hold your bags for if you like. Uh, there's a bus service that can bring you out if you just want to change clothes. You know, we have the gym facilities that have restrooms and so forth if you want to change clothes for it and so forth. And, uh, you know, try to accommodate the knowing that when more often than not, we wouldn't have the rooms available for them, but giving them an alternative to it. And the other is, in my hotels I was in Key, in Key Lager for, everyone wanted to stay late. Obviously, yeah, yeah. So the reverse of it was we had completely set up a system where we're asking you to check out on time. We will hold your bags. We have full bathroom shower facilities near the pool area and so forth. You can stay on property. Enjoy yourself. We're going to give you a discount to the restaurant. We didn't give them free food. We gave them a discount to the restaurant. Enjoy your time until you leave in the afternoon. But you got to get out of the room because everybody that, you know, when you came in, you want to get in the room when it was due. Yeah. Well, those people are right behind you. So they're going to be coming in, too. So, you know, do us this courtesy of checking out on time. And this is what we're going to offer you. I tried to do that with my New York property saying, look, guys, you, you're going to get some uh, more international travel if you can make this flex of saying, look, we can't necessarily get through the room all the time, but this is what we can do for you. Yeah. No. And, and it's like, you, okay. you want to be careful how you say that because you never, ever want to plant the seed in any guest's head that there's someone slept in that room before or after them. Like it's <laughs> oh, that just oh, I, yeah. I tell them that George Washington slept there. The guy from New Guinea yeah. slept there. No, <laughs> no, no, that is a pristine, clean room. No one's ever been in that room before. It's I it's funny that you say that. There is nothing that steams me out more these days. I'm not kidding. It's this is such a funny point. I'm completely digressing, but nothing skews me out more. Than those sanitary TV remote controls. Yeah. <laughs> Have you seen those? The ones yeah, that yeah. they're yeah. they're like the white antibacterial. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. If, yeah. if you're There's lucky, they're white. Right. I've checked in a couple times and it's been a dingy gray, and I'm like, I, oh. this may be flat, but I don't think it's exactly. sanitary. But even if they look white, there's nothing I want to touch. <laughs> Yeah. You've reminded me of the fact that it needs antibacterial. You know, a regular, plain, yeah. old, ordinary remote control, I pick that up, I do it. Yeah, you know, I don't think well, it's, a good, millions it's a good right? thing. Well, it's, kind of, it's kind of like not reading. It's kind of like not reading an article about how hot dogs are made before you enjoy your right. <laughs> <laughs> out. You know, sometimes exactly. you just want to have that. <laughs> yeah. Ignorance, Ignorance, yeah. Yeah. Exactly right. so, yeah. so going back to the article, you have all been just 
making my point for me. And I want to thank you all for that so much that I brought up last week, which is if we had booking systems with 24-hour check-in where you picked your arrival and departure times at the time of the reservation and your room rate was based on how long or how short you were staying, this would not be an operational nightmare as Robert kindly suggested last week that it could be because you would already know who's checking out early from Key Largo. And that way you could use that room to accommodate the people who are checking in early and the system wouldn't allow them to book if the room wasn't ready early. And anyway, early, I, I think you're right. I think you're absolutely right. All we have to do now is replace all the property management systems. Absolutely. The so tomorrow oh, sounds like should be right. we'll get right on that, you know, <laughs> right. and that's, that's a valid point. So I do kind of. Well, and re-educate every single guest ever as well. So. Well, right. Yeah. But I, I do really appreciate that people are attempting to make steps because, to be honest, that's how technology is developed. Nobody's going to develop a technology without a use case that has been tested. So once we get further down the road with this and we're like, OK, this is working really well from a financial aspect until we have to give a bunch of refunds to guests because they're unhappy or whatever the case may be. We're going to actually have data behind it that hopefully developers will take a look at and begin to build systems that support this type of check-in and check-out. Because if it was available to them from the get-go, then the guests wouldn't be unhappy because they would know exactly what time they reserved an arrival and a departure. I have a legitimate question here. I, this, is not a, this is not a leading question. This isn't a loaded question because I don't know the answer to this at all. Um, do you, any of you have any examples of properties who actually keep track of the number of guests who ask for late check-in, late check-out, early check-in, late check-out? No. Yeah, so you want the front, front desk agents, agents to do something, Tim? I'm sorry? <laughs> you want well, the front desk oh, agents yeah, to totally. track something? Totally. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah UK, UK, UK properties do, certainly. I'm sorry? Certainly for morning arrivals. UK properties for morning arrivals yeah, and things yeah, like that, it, certainly. Certainly doing a big yeah, way. Um, a lot of the ones with day rate problem, but I'd love to know how big a problem this really is. For some yeah, properties, a lot of sure airport, doesn't exist. For some properties, I'm sure it happens. You know, literally with you know two thirds of the guests they get every day. Mm -hmm. right? well, I think independently, those yeah. that charge for it probably have some sort of a monitoring of it in right. that sense. Right. Yeah. Well, certainly these folks. Maybe so not the denials of people that say, screw you, yeah. I'm not going to pay it, but they definitely would have a list of those that said, okay, fine. But the, the, the key is to get it into the property management system yeah. because a lot of, and where a lot of these things like day rate, and there, there have been like a half dozen or, or more who've tried to get into this, you know, day, day rate rental. And it is, it's very, it's very lucrative if you can execute well. Um, but you've got to get it integrated with your main PMS because otherwise now you have this small little block of rooms, which it may need to be bigger sometimes or smaller. Some, and it just creates so many, you know, so many issues, right? Where it, yeah. it's, it's tough. Yeah. You, you really need, you need a rule based system. And, and my recommendation actually is to have, because you also want to make it simple. You don't want to create so many <laughs> You can't tell how much it's going to cost. And if you're variably pricing it by days versus nights versus hours, it's going to be impossible. But you should have kind of, here's a, my theory. Would be, you have a rate. It's $150. If you want to come in early, you can add this much. If you can, if you want to stay late, it's this much. If you only need it during the day, it's this, you know, so you can at least kind of categorize them into commonly demanded, you know. Uh, you know. I tried to do that back in 2011. I thought that this was lovely. We were implementing iHotelier at an independent resort, and I saw that there was an option for me to build this. And you could say, you know, if you want to check in between this and this, it's this much. If you want this and this, it's this much. It was built as sort of like a package. And so I had implemented that originally, and I got huge pushback from management saying, we don't want to piss off our guests. So don't charge for early departures and late checkouts ever. And I was like, okay, but shouldn't there be a balance between the two? So I think that that's something that we're also fighting is the ability to push for that versus, you know, the, the kind of pushback of we can't ever do anything where we're asking our guests for money because it will upset them, which is where we're the far opposite of the airline industry, right? They're too far one way. We're too far the other way. I know we try not to talk about politics, but that's basically what this is, is two very, very polar sides of a topic. And I think that there's always going to be a happy medium. And I will say that for some brands 
or for some hotels, they may need to be slightly on one side, whereas others may need to be slightly on the other side, depending on the demographics of their user base um, or their customer base. So I think that that's really important for people to understand what's important to the type of guests that you have. If you're a heavily leisure hotel, probably you should be charging for early check-in and late checkout to Tim's focus group of one point. Whereas if you are a business hotel and you can include it maybe in negotiated rates, but not at other rates. And that goes back to people looking outside of the user block because they don't get that type of a benefit. So you really, I mean, you have to customize what you're doing to your user base and what makes sense and what's valued to them. I actually just had this happen to me um, a couple of weeks ago when I was at the innovation conference, I couldn't get a flight out on Friday night. And so uh, because I had several conference calls on Friday afternoon, I transferred from a hotel in Manhattan over to an airport property, and I wanted to check in at 10 a.m. because I had conference calls, and I did not want to be taking those in the lobby, right? Yeah. So I, I asked to check in. She's like, well, it's going to be $50, and I was like, oh, I'm really not trying to spend money right now. She said, but because it was a Holiday Inn, if you sign up for Priority Club, I can give it to you for free. And I was like, okay, I don't need, I don't care about more emails. I get enough junk emails as it is. Sign me up for Priority Club. I very seldom pay for hotel rooms, so this is not ever going to do me any good. But if it gets me an early check-in right now, I am happy to help you with your quota of signing up extra Priority Club members at the desk today. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to come back around on this one as that is exactly what you don't want to do. You as the guest want that. But yeah, it's great like, for me. Gonna- getting so little value out of that person signing up for your loyalty program Mm -hmm. in those cases. But I guarantee they have a quota at the desk. Oh, they absolutely. What we don't talk about with this is breakage. A lot of people sign up for this stuff and just unsubscribe as soon as it comes through. Well, look, I've said this more than once on this show. I know a guy with a Harley Davidson tattoo, right? I know a guy with the Apple logo tattooed on his arm. I have never met anybody with a Hilton tattoo. (laughs) <laughs> but right. Barack Obama may have a hamster tattoo that we don't know about. What's that? But Barack Obama may have a Hampton Inn tattoo that we don't know about. <laughs> that's true. And, and Robert Robert does have a Four Seasons tattoo in a place we don't want to see it. But that's that's a whole other story. That's right. Um, so it's there is nice there's another article that's a very nice little tree. tree. Yeah. The, the 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 it does tie into another article, which is the loyalty uh, program uh, one, right. where they're talking about membership. Because we've had that discussion before is their membership reward. I'd like to add one closing comment to the last uh, item of it. I think you should put a fee structure associated with the value proposition of, of these kind of things and then just have it so it's on file. So if you do want to refer to it, if you ever want to go to it as a value proposition of what you're not charging somebody, kind of a reverse of it. Like, hey, we could oh, charge yeah. you this, but we're right. not because you're doing this. Right. Rather than not have it at all, it should at least be, to your point, with a strong leisure market where you have the, the value proposition of, of, of earlier or late check-ins, then that is a value proposition you can show that you're getting because you're you're trying to create some sort of, of loyalty or, or relationship value to them. So, yeah. But the I'm membership sure. model, I'm I'm sure I'm sure. this story, uh, when I was leading, we, we had a meeting with a property um, and uh, the, the property, the, the, the guy who, um, he was like, I don't remember what his title was at the property. He was essentially like the controller or something like that was in the meeting. He was the, he was one of the AGMs um, and he was responsible for the financial side. And he was talking about how they made more revenue by taking a whole bunch of uh, stuff that had been, uh, um, you know, back of house type of things and turning them into various kinds of fee based services, you know, and things, right. Um, sorry, I'm telling the story badly because I don't remember the specifics of the room types that they created. Nonetheless, our chief marketing officer at the time said, right, but what about, you know, what about the intangible brand value of some of these things and not charging for it? And he said, oh, it's very simple. He said, anytime we talk about intangible brand value, we pay for those with intangible dollars. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't know that nice. that's exactly the right approach in every case, but yes, Lauren, I agree with you. You should have at least an understanding of what the economic value is to you. You know, Again, we have a revenue management professional who does this every single day on the on the call or on the on the show. But you know, I always start with value based pricing. I mean, when we think about revenue, when we think about what we're charging, when we think about what the, the going rate is or whatever, we also have to be thinking about what is the value to the guest and then pricing that accordingly 
or not pricing it and offering it as a value add. Mm -hmm. But it's always based on what is this doing for the perception of the value that the guest gets for what they're paying you. Right. right. Yeah. And are you exceeding their expectations? And are you, ex well, that is a huge, actually, are you at because to get that social? I agree with you. Like, exceeding would be great, but can we start with needing? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? yeah but, but you were talking, you made a great point about the, the social contract versus just kind of the financial, yeah, legal, legal commitment sort of thing. Anytime you can get on that, and with the, the clerks going, hey, here, yes, you can come in early, but I think we normally charge for it, but hey, I'm taking care of you. Huge, huge right. benefit yeah. to that right. sort of right. thing. And your policy may be, yeah, you know, you don't have to charge anybody. It's not, you are not, you do not have a quota to go collect so much in early revenue, you know, early arrival revenue. Um, so yeah, if you can do things like that, um, the most successful concierges, I mean, super high-end concierges who would get you know, $500 tips going out, they would refuse to, um, people, a lot of the Europeans would, would need postage stamps, right? Not so much in the internet era, but that was like a little thing. This one guy, Italian, unbelievable, he refused. That was kind of his little shtick. He would not let them pay for postage stamps. It was my, and he would get indignant and argue with them loudly and <laughs> you are insulting my profession. And they would check, and he would insist, and he would throw money back at them and go, "You're you're insulting me." And boy, they would they loved the guy, right? They would come back. It was unbelievable. Yeah. So anyway, I have got to go. My daughter is uh, just finished her interview for graduate school, and I need to go pick her up. So. Wow! You got to take her. You got to take her for a piece of pie. Well, I don't. I'm going to talk to her. Like, is she is she out early because it went well or it didn't i don't know well, <laughs> <laughs> well hopefully everything went very well no no, no. She, she said it, she said it went well so the first question was are you related to robert cole and she's like yes yeah. like, this is, this is no, no, no 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 not not no. in the not in the slide. um one point before i go that came out of the piece of focus right research and then um the Kara Swisher comment about rundles, which is recurring, recurring revenue bundles, are a huge thing driving valuations on the inter, on internet shares. Um, the focus right asked travelers um, if Amazon offered travel services, oh, yes. would you use them instead of your current preferred provider? That was a scary so number. Who you normally go to? Right, like what you're currently forty-two percent. Yeah. yeah, I wonder if you asked though five years ago if Amazon offered a phone, would you switch to them? How many people would have said yes theoretically, right? And how many people now use an Amazon phone? So, and also Amazon yeah. did offer travel services for a while there, and they took, yeah, they took oh, them off. I only do about two because they could never oh. quite crack the code. Hey, no, can I do my no. can I do my anti-Amazon and travel rant? That I'm going to be so wrong. I will leave. Say hi, Mr. Robert. Hi, Robert. And I, I hit Don't the red turn button. Don't right No, no the not the red, red button. Do not hit the red button. You, have you told Lily about not hitting the red button? I didn't she have did. to. She came into the gun and much smarter than we did. Oh. <laughs> okay, that's, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, red, bad. Red, bad. All right. So this is, I'll do this really quick because I fully acknowledge that the, the problem with making bold proclamations like the one I'm about to is you you only have to be wrong once, right? You know, this is one of those where there's a lot of ways for me to be wrong and only one way for me to be right, which is Amazon never enters travel in again, right? Mm -hmm. um, that there's a very strong argument to be made that Amazon is not well suited to travel. This is the argument, and I, I lean towards it, but they could certainly prove me wrong easily as I just say that. Right. The things that make Amazon great today um, actually don't benefit the travel ecosystem at all. Right. right. You know, they have tons and tons and tons of inventory that they can warehouse easily. Well, obviously, in travel, that's, you know, their access to inventory is going to be limited by connectivity and things along those lines. Right. They have free shipping and fast shipping. They can put it in people's hands really quick. Obviously, again, with travel, there's no benefit there, right? 
So the things that make them effective at typical e-commerce and the things that make travel travel don't necessarily align. And Stuart, it's very much to your point about the phone. It's they have benefits in some very clear areas that make them very tough to compete with if you are also competing in those areas. And if you're competing in a different area, those benefits don't actually advantage them in this new space. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I could be dead wrong about that because they could solve for these lots of different ways. But they don't have the huge advantage that, that, that but they don't have the huge advantage right, that they right. have when they're competing with Walmart or when they're yeah. competing with, you know, other yeah. physical retail yeah. type. And, and the weird thing about brand perception is it's, it's very narrow. Like what you trust a brand for in your life varies dramatically. Like what I trust Apple with, I use an Apple phone and Apple computer, but when Apple plus TV plus came out, I have no interest in that. There's no value for me and there's no brand tie to them as a media producer. Right. And so, but Disney, who I don't have any other affinity with other than I'm a huge Star Wars nerd, I jumped on and pre-bought that way beforehand, you know? So, and they came out similar price point, similar time. Content was obviously different, but brands, you know, the, the different brands mean a different thing to me at different points in, in, in my life. Amazon and travel just isn't synonymous to me. I don't know that I would just go to Amazon for travel just because they had it. They'd have to give me a value that I don't get somewhere else. Right. I will say to Tim's point, though, um, it seems like you are describing Amazon as an e-commerce retail company. I'm, oh, I'm not. I'm not. I'm saying that they're they're they are advantages in those specific categories that they dominate. But we know what kind of company they are, right? Well, there are there are I mean there's a couple different kinds of companies, right? They are a logistics company, they are a uh they are a hosting company, they are a e-commerce company, they're a marketplace. But at the top, at the very top, Amazon is a yeah. data company. Yeah, I get that, but I, I have a huge problem with that, Lily. I have a huge problem with that formulation. And the, the problem I have with that formulation is it's data in service of what? There, ha there has to be a customer demand for something that they provide to those customers. And they're gathering that information through AWS. So because they're creating yes and no. Yes and no. Cloud hosting for, you know, when I was at the innovation conference, I went to an AWS yeah. Yeah. Um, thing and they are helping entrepreneurs build out new companies on their cloud and seeing oh, yeah. exactly what's performing well and what's not performing well of the latest technology the latest services that are happening so i'm sure that in their agreements they jointly own a lot of that data and they can leverage that now whether or not that allows them to get into travel is something else entirely but they, i think they that they're don't jointly own the data though I'm actually an advisor to a company that is built on AWS, and that data belongs to the company. AWS has no rights to that data. It's kind of like you are correct. Yeah, yes. I don't think anyone would build on that platform if that correct. were the case. Correct. Well, yeah. it's like Boeing to the airlines. Boeing isn't bringing, isn't, isn't in the airline business. They're in the plane making business, and the airlines use their product. It's the same yeah. too with the. Uh, is how I imagine I, Amazon. I, Amazon's I, in I, the Microsoft data, uh, business. Microsoft sells fairly successfully against Amazon with certain types of enterprises by yeah. literally telling people, we can guarantee you we're never getting into your business. We only right. provide the platform, right? Yeah. Um, but I, and don't get me wrong. I mean, a lot of companies like to say they're a data company and, and data is incredibly powerful. And some, some may say it's the crown jewels. Some yeah. even say some it's the crown jewels. It's a new currency. <laughs> Well, if that's a line of mine, actually, it starts being funny. Um, <laughs> I would say, oh, I would say content is king, customer experience is queen, and data is the crown jewel. So I, I actually agree with that completely. Because uh, you say it. I would hope you agree with it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but so the data that they get where you are 100% right that is incredibly valuable is they do get to see what kinds of services are most successful on AWS, right? They can see, hey, we got a whole bunch of travel folks over here who are doing very well. Maybe there's a there there. They also, that, they also probably get some of that data just by people who go into, you know, the search box on Amazon.com or on a, a, A9 or things like that and type in travel deals. And I'm sure that occurs today that they're probably looking at that kinds of data from that perspective. 
Oh, and there's there's cookies all over the place because anything I search online, whether I search it on Amazon or not, I probably oh, yeah, get it yeah, yeah, for it yeah. in for Amazon. Else. So. And to me, that's the most likely place where they get into travel. And we've seen some in a bigger way. We've seen some examples of this. You know, Amazon is one of the biggest sellers of advertising in the world. Um, it is a, it is an enormous component of their business. Um, and so, you know, we've seen things where you have prime offers where, hey, prime as a prime member, you get a deal on specific types of travel or the like. I can absolutely see that growing and the like. But if you think about things like AWS, if you think about what they've done with logistics in terms of, so you know, you all know FedEx fired Amazon, right? FedEx fired Amazon because Amazon has its own fleets of trucks and planes and such. Right. Um, what Amazon does that's very smart, very, very smart. And, you know, there's this myth that they started AWS because they said, wow, we have all this excess hosting capacity. We should start selling to people. That is not what happened at all. What Amazon looked at was, was said, we have a need for flexible storage. We have a need for flexible bandwidth. We have a need for flexible hosting because our volumes over the course of the year vary widely based on, you know, Prime Day, Black Friday, holidays, whatever, whatever, whatever. And when I say our, I mean the marketplace as well as, you know, the things that they sell as a merchant directly. And so they, they then looked and said, can we get into the picks and shovels business right in a in a mining boom and actually create a service that yes we will be the first customer for but we can then sell to other people but right. set up as a separate thing that we are the first customer and with logistics with trucking and shipping and freight they did exactly the same thing of uh, they are the first customer but they build it to sell to a second customer and a third customer and a fourth customer you know, and I think that's the third reason why I don't know that travel's a perfect fit for them. Right. Because I don't know that they're the first customer ever for that. Yeah. Maybe they are, but it just doesn't seem to align with the things that they tend to do. And again, all I have to do is be wrong once on this. There's a lot of ways to be wrong and only one way to be right. Well, and, and they've tried several times. They, yeah, they, don't, they don't see it the same way you do. They, they've tried to get well, into travel. Keep looking for the way to say, how do we yeah. get there? Well, I think I think that if they're smart, what they would do is make it more of a referral out where they can sort of yeah. display inventory, partner with or, you know, crazy idea, acquire Expedia or booking something along those lines. That would be a big move if Google or Amazon were to acquire one of them rather than try to build their own ecosystem. Yeah. And I think that. You know, it, it would be really interesting, though, and Google's probably even better positioned for the analytics on this. But like what people are buying, does that relate in any way to their travel? For example, if somebody's always buying wine gift baskets or something like that, where wine themed items on Amazon, do you target them with wine country vacations? Mm hmm. You know, there's some yeah. implications oh, yeah. there that could be really interesting. Yeah. And, and sure. honestly, it would be helpful. You know, we talked a little bit last week about destination properties who need to compete on a national scale instead of a local scale. That could be really beneficial to them. So maybe they should be targeting it from a marketing perspective. Like yeah. we can sell you better sure. targeted marketing. And I think that's the way they would inevitably have to go because they don't have, you, you, I mean, you're right. They have a lot of data, but they don't have the right kind of data because you, you, they have inferable right. data. Like if someone buys a suitcase, that there's an inference that they're traveling or whatnot, but they don't have the right travel data in terms of when people are traveling, where they're traveling, what they're interested in when they travel, what they're doing when they travel. So folks like Google have more data and better data. TripAdvisor certainly does. Expedia does. Booking does. There's all these other companies out there that have better data than them on this particular challenge or, or problem. So I think they would have to either dip their toe into it through advertising and do what Google did, go from advertising to meta search to direct bookings to essentially taking over the travel industry. They're either <laughs> going to have to do that or they're going to have to go acquire someone. For, I don't remember the exact successful. I don't remember the exact phrase, but I, I kind of look at Amazon as being the big guy in the room. And you're and I don't like I said, you're only smart until you open your mouth. Um, you know, <laughs> with just standing there being big and intimidating is probably more of an impact of us talking about this than the fact that they get into the space and they're not good at it. 
mm-hmm. you know, that they start trying to get engaged with this. Because to your point, logistically, their logistics don't fit into what we're doing, which kind of ties to one of the other articles, which is the the complete trip, the the magic unicorn, yeah. 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 Uh, sim, you know, ability to combine these things. Because when you look at Amazon from a retail perspective, their suggestive tool there, if you bought this, you might like this. If you get this, most people get this. When you look at this, these are other things that have been looked at. That suggestive combination tool yeah, that has something you look at and go, man, wouldn't that be great in the travel space where, you know, yeah. I'm I'm doing this trip. So I want those things to be brought to my attention without me having to go find out that there was a widget that I should have had bought when I bought this thing. You know, I, I didn't want to miss the biggest ball of twine when I was in the town that had it, you know. Yeah. So those kind of those kind of thoughts are really cool ideas. But, you know, like I said, jumping over to the other article, uh, you know, it, it seems like this is, a, according to the article, a race of attention where Expedia is trying to think that they're going to get ahead of the Google issue, which I totally want to geek out about, uh, Mr. Stewart, about um, the Google squeeze and also BERT. I just went, uh, Milestone did a great webinar. I highly recommend uh, you play back. Banu is phenomenally talented at SEO mm-hmm. and uh she did a great webinar on describing the real impact of BERT as to what it's doing. And it ties a little bit to the Google Squeeze article. But I, I want to try to hit on this connected trip. I didn't know that this was such – I mean, this was, to me, a fiction story. Everyone wants this ability for it to go together. I didn't realize that it's turned into a major blown effort. Do the they, though? Do, they, do you think that's true, a statement that everyone wants this, like to what they're describing? Oh, I, I do. I absolutely do. It's It's – Think about the Star Trek computer, right, for a second. Every um, minute of every day I think about that. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> I, I knew I was going to be talking your language. Yeah. So the idea of the connected trip mm-hmm. is, uh, first, let's take a big step back and just define terms for a second. The way I think about it, and I think the way the article talks about it a fair bit, is, you know, A, how do you alert people to things that are going to be of value to them when they're on their journey? And and. More broadly, how do you help them recover from, uh, or excuse me, more specifically, how do you help them recover when there are issues? You know, your flight has been delayed. How do we get you where you need to go and the like? If you could, in fact, do that well, where, you know, whether it's via technology, you know, machine learning, whatever, 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 it doesn't matter, you know, how you get there. It matters that you do it effectively. That's an enormous differentiator for me to want to do all my booking through Expedia or Booking.com and ex- and in this specific case, explicitly not go to Google, right? Sure. Because it's, it's I want to use Expedia because they know everything about my travel and they're going to take care of me every step of the way. That's an enormous, enormous advantage for an Expedia. I, I, right. I get that in theory, right? But but in, in reality, I mean, how many apps do you use on your phone? Like if you if you went and swiped up right oh, now. Literally use, or, like, literally use like eight. And I literally use, though? And I like, use a really? lot compared to a lot of people. You use your eight, install. You use eight apps. Swipe up on your phone. Everyone do this for me real quick and see how many, if you haven't killed your apps, how many? One, two, three, four, five, um, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Are we going with what's right. installed and are we counting? No, no I'm talking apps? about what's open. What's an active app right now on your phone? I, I okay, have 25, yeah. right? 25. Here's, here's all my apps that I have on my phone. There's, there's, a re- there's a reason that, that a Facebook exists and a Twitter exists and a WhatsApp exists no, 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 no. And, and an Instagram exists and all these other shows and a Snapchat exists, right? Because they all do things slightly different and have a slightly different value proposition. And, and they're best in class at doing that thing that you want, that value that you want to get from them. I don't believe that it, it's, it's realistic to assume that one person's going to get this supremacy in every aspect of the travel to where no, I, I, I'm – I'm benefited by using one solution, one whether it's an app or an ecosystem or whatever. I just I don't think that's how consumers work, and and it, it boxes us in too, and it, it eliminates here, choice. But here's the thing, right? It's it's the old joke about the two guys walking through the woods, and a bear comes charging towards them, and the first guy just drops down, pulls off his boots, <laughs> puts a pair of shoes, a pair right. of running shoes. Right? I don't have to outrun the bear; I just have to outrun yeah. you. Sure. You know? They don't have to get it perfect. They just have to do it better than Google is going to do. I think it's a confidence issue so that Google is doing a better job of this. I, than I don't know because I'm I'm a and this again. This is I'm doing a Tim Peter. This is a one person, right? This is just my opinion. <laughs> I'm always gonna 
prefer. By the way, I have to point out, we all do this. I just yeah. call it now when I do it. This is true. <laughs> I'm always going to prefer to to use disparate systems that provide unique value in in my unique context than one ecosystem that tries to do everything kind of okay. You know, I want the best at each thing personally. Well, I've been doing this That's why I tried to see the the complete oh. reason. And it never works because I try to make a, a hotel go, I want to let you know of all the cool stuff that's in the market. And it's a, it's a, it's a FOMO thing. It's a fear of missing out. And it's also a trust issue. Why should I trust that what you're showing me on your map, on your hotel website, is everything that I might be interested in? I'm still going to go to Google and look at Google's map sure. and make sure that I'm not missing. Agree. I don't agree. I, and, and the reason I don't agree is not a focus group. But one, it's decades of consumer research on this topic of the idea of satisficing <laughs> Right. People, people will stop when it's good enough. And the problem, the reason you go to these different apps today, for, and I want to be very clear, obviously you use Twitter for a specific thing. You use Facebook for a specific thing. You use LinkedIn for a specific thing. There's actually a reason for that specific set of behaviors, which is that you are segregating the publics that you talk to into different universes. Right. So that's a very specific set of behavior. But when you're looking for information, you, you're looking for information to you get your question answered. The reason people look around today is because they don't get great answers. As good as Google is, as good as Google has gotten compared to what search looked like 20 years ago, it still sucks. Because sometimes, you know, it's the old, it's the old joke about if I search for Java, sometimes I'm looking for the island in the South Pacific, sometimes I'm looking for the programming language, and sometimes I'm looking for a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. and the reality is Google doesn't get that right near often enough in terms of knowing what I meant on that specific one. But Bert is helping. Bert's so helping. helping. Bert will absolutely <laughs> help with that. But, but Bert is, you know, I, I, I haven't seen the Banu thing, and Banu is brilliant, so I don't want to, like, sound like I'm crapping on, on my No, no, she's, she's just Bert. talking about how to work around what it's doing. Yeah, Bert is really cool and really important and all that other kind of stuff. And also, it, it probably amounts to 10% of the searches on mobile in terms of the places where it come into effect. So, I mean, it's a piece of a piece. A big, it's only in the U.S. right now. It's only in English. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it's a, it is a perfect representation of exactly what we're talking about, of the technology being sophisticated enough to anticipate and do the right thing, Right. But it's only 10% of 50% and only in the U.S. because this is a really hard problem to solve. All right, so let me ask you this. Do you – for anything you ever want to search for, do you always use Google? I bet um, you don't because if it's a video, you're probably on YouTube or if it's a product, you're probably on Amazon or if it's a director well, yeah, for a movie, it's probably on IMDb. And you know, if it, or if it's an ex-girlfriend, it's probably on Facebook. So Expedia.com <laughs> want it to be that right. if I'm looking for – travel it's expedia or booking.com right. that's right. the problem they're trying to solve right? right but it's partly that but it's also trying to take control of the entire the entire experience of travel the, from the no, flight in the car in, in the, the hotel and everything right the, from the customer's perspective they it's want to control the yeah, yeah, I think behavior store that's what it is it's kind of the dichotomy between customers want convenience but they also want choices they want yeah. to feel yeah. like they're being given yeah. choices oh. They want to feel like they're getting the best deal. And without there appearing to be competition, they're not going to feel like they're getting the best deal, which is how direct booking issues started in the first place, right, for hotels. So I think that it really just depends because I love the connected trip in theory. But would I trust that app to get me as good of a replacement flight as what I can do on my own? Because I guarantee you. If my flight is delayed, like let's say I have a connection and my second flight is going to be delayed. I'm a super impatient person when it comes to airports. I don't like to hang out there. So before we have pulled up to the gate, I have already identified if there is a satisfactory replacement flight on any airline that will accommodate me. If I'm on a United or Mm -hmm. Something like that. I'm looking at the whole Star Alliance. I've already pulled up the entire airport's flight ecosystem of what's going out to my desired point of arrival. And I will walk right up to the gate and say, hey, I need you to rebook me on this specific flight number. By the I way, I agree, but this this is where the focus group of one is very dangerous because one, mm -hmm. we are all very sophisticated travelers. Right, absolutely. Right. And I think that it, it, there's a huge market for it. 
because I will say that, you know, I work with a lot of sophisticated people, but when it comes to my team traveling, if one of them loses their connection, they're more likely to be frustrated. That's right. I'm more likely to solve it before they get to their connection for them remotely. And so that's where it would come in handy because one person can't always do that for everybody. And so it would be a boon to a lot of people. And, uh, and my point is it would, if you pulled up to the gate, if you pulled up to the terminal rather, and your phone had already alerted you, let's just say the Expedia app, right? I'll make Expedia the hero here for a second, which is probably the only time in history you will ever hear me <laughs> say that. <laughs> right. But if the Expedia app has alerted you to the fact of, Hey, your, your connecting flight is delayed. Here are three other options that we found that we think will work for you. Right. And they get that right compared to you doing the research a couple of times in a row. In all likelihood, you're going to start to trust them. That's the holy grail. That's they got a long way to go to get to the holy grail. But it goes Stuart, It goes precisely to what you said a moment ago of you're absolutely right. When I'm looking for a video, I go to YouTube. And when I'm looking for, uh, uh, you know, I want to buy a new pop socket for my phone. I go to Amazon when I'm looking for, you know, whatever. I go to, you know, I'm looking to hire somebody. I go to Indeed, right? So that's absolutely true. What booking and what booking and Expedia are, are terrified of is that when you need that in travel, you will do it at Google, and then they mm -hmm. lose the whole ball of wax. Yeah, that's right. so literally what they. I, I get, I get why they're trying to do it. I just, I don't, I don't have confidence in I their ability to pieces. deliver. Oh, I, I, I agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> going to turn pieces like I, it would be really nice if, if when I get to an airport and I've, I've, I've trusted Uber enough that they're going to pre-qualify a car for me to show up on. And they're just going to show me how to get to where I need to go get to the Uber car. You know, um, those those kind of uh, nice. kind of helpful, things, you know, and, and if, rather than, you know, one of the things I did and, and, and people look at me really strange, but they do that anyway. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm walking now with my little POV camera that I have when I leave from the, ta the gate to the to taxi place. With the 10 foot pole? Like no, 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 no. I got okay. in New York. You were a okay. Liberty's nightmare. Okay. You were my 10 foot yeah, pole. Sure. They were like, hey. but anyway. So I do my little POV <laughs> thing, okay? And now I'm hyperlapsing them because now I'm trying to put them onto the websites for people that are traveling that are. That are there's a, there's a travel anxieties and so forth. There's okay. Well, I'm here. How do I get to there? And you know, so I wanted to take the the bus and the train to get to the my, one of my clients' hotels from the airport from LaGuardia, rather than doing Uber. So I literally video snapped, you know, the going down to where you go to the bus and getting on the bus from the bus to the train, the train on, and then showing the train and so forth. And I'm, I'm montaging that into a hyperlapse so that. If there's a hey, if you you know to save a couple of bucks, it costs you three bucks to get to the to the hotel from the LaGuardia, and you, and you don't have to mess with traffic. Here's how you do it, and it's just a little you know, and it pauses when it gets to a place you got to recognize, and it zooms in when you you know accelerates the timeline, and it's just a little it's a content thing, and this goes back to a little bit more of our, our Google Squeeze conversation and the Burke conversation stuff like this. It's the the, the zero click options that are coming now. That's the, right. the traffic that's going to it. The, the authenticity now that I can go over and when you're saying, how do I get to my XYZ hotel from LaGuardia? The answer's on my website, not somebody else's. That, right. that, that zero, you know, Google click is there kind of thing. But, so, that's, but that's what booking and Expedia are trying to say is they're trying to say we should be the destination. Think about the, think about the things today that should be easy, that should be easy. I live in a, in a semi-rural area. I live in technically what they call exurban, uh, the exurbs, not the suburbs, right? <laughs> um, um, you know, it's old farmland that is being that is being uh, uh, gentrified in reverse, I guess. You know, people moving out to whatever. Doesn't matter. Anyway, the point being, if I go to Google Maps and I say I want to take the train to New York City, it tells me I can't get there from here. All right. Despite the fact that I can get in my car and I can drive 15 minutes to a train station and they ought to be smart enough to tell me, well, you can't take the train all the way. But what you can do is this. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. That's the thing that Booking and Expedia are trying to solve for, you know, narrow it down to a very simple use case. We know you're going from point A to point B. We, we'd like to know you're renting a car or you're taking an Uber. We'd like to know you're staying in this hotel or that hotel. 
And we'd like to be able to say, if things come up along the way of something that's a, a service recovery issue, which I suspect is what's driving this more, right? Or an enhancement issue of, hey, you, we know you like a lot about the world's largest ball of twine. We should let you know that it's actually a 20-minute walk from here. That's the that's the thing they want to do so that when people want to search for travel, they will start by going to Booking or Expedia. Let me ask you this. Do you, what, what, are, what are you – so we're going to do a straw poll of four. So what do you guys use for um, GPS in your car when you're trying to get somewhere for directions? Google. Google, I use, Google Maps. In my car, I use yeah. Waze. Okay, Waze. Oh, yeah, true. Yeah. Yeah. Which, is, which is owned by Alphabet, right? That's a Google product now. No, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. No, no. This is perfect, though. This also gets to your point. Waze is owned by Google, right? Yeah. But it is a very different consumer right. experience. Yeah. Because Waze so, is optimized. So, Lily, you use Google Maps, driver. is what you said. What do you use, Lauren? I use Waze if I'm driving because of traffic concerns of, of okay. things and stuff. But I usually use Google Maps. And I use Waze as well, right? And it is yeah. it is owned by Google, but it's it is operated completely independent. It's part of Alphabet, right? So it's 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 they are bringing some of the Google they Maps. They are right, but, but it's better, better, it, it does certain things better than than Google Maps. It does certain things better than Apple Maps. And yeah. every one of do we all have iPhones? What do you have, Lily? Do you have an iPhone? Android. Android. So, so that you're using the default mapping. So the other three of us that use Apple products are, are ignoring the default app that was on our phone, installed a separate app because it does something better because it's specifically built for that. There's now, no I way. Run, so I have a Google search. I, run, I, motorcycle when I, drive motorcycle, I use Apple because my directions are on my watch. So when I drive a motorcycle, it'll vibrate and tell so me that's when that's a convenience thing. Yeah. 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 And it's convenience for me entirely because I have my Google search bar. It kind of keeps my search history, which is really helpful for me because earlier on, I'm going to map it on Google just to see what the time is going to be. So I know when to leave. Right. Let's be honest. I don't drive a lot. I stay home a lot. Um, but so I want to understand what the time difference is going to be. And then later when I want to go, I don't have to refind that address because it's in my Google search history bar. So it's kind of one click for me. Convenience if I want to stop yeah. at a gas station or a coffee shop, I can say find a long route. And I know Waze has some things like that, but I don't trust that Waze has everything on it. I believe that it only has sponsored things on it. Whether or not that belief is true is immaterial. So, so that, that's another true. great point, though, right? For the same reason we have two two parties on the political spectrum in this country, you can give people the same information, and different people are going to make right. completely different opinions of that information. Right. Even though it's right. the same, their perception is going to be different. So that's another reason why I don't think either XP or Booking.com are going to crack this, and, and they describe it as a space race where winner takes all, and someone's going to have a monopoly. If that were possible, then either Coke or Pepsi would be would have gone out of business a long time yeah. ago, right? Yeah, like if people it. wanted to have only one choice, there'd be a lot of things that are different in the world. I, I also use Waze when I know that I'm going to go to somebody's place because I can forward over my arrival time, which I think is a great thing with Waze. Yeah, it is. Because it's a neat little utility, right? And that's yeah. what it comes down to. Yeah. When you focus yeah. on one specific feature or function or, or, or solving one problem, you can have yeah. more innovation. Like when you try to be all things to all people, you're a jack of all trades and you're a master of none. Yeah. Now, do you advertise on Waze? Do you have any clients advertising on Waze? Yeah, we've dabbled with it a little bit. Yeah. I mean, mixed success depending on the scenario, but it's, yeah, it's neat. Yeah, it's certain clients. Yeah. I mean, I don't, none of the New York properties I use, because it's ridiculous, nobody drives, but the, right. but the yeah. other properties and locations, yeah, I put Waze on there. I'm going to have to drop in just a second. I, yeah, I, I do too. I one o'clock today and I have to powder my nose before my one o'clock call. <laughs> um, uh, one quick, one quick point. Stores, if it, if this wasn't clear, I also agree with you completely that this is not going to be winner take all, right? Okay. I, I think Lily said it perfectly in the Coke versus Pepsi analogy. There's yeah. going to be a Coke and there's going to be a Pepsi. They're trying to make sure again that they're not outrunning the bear. They're just outrunning the they're other. Not, they're not yeah. Dr. Oh, Pepsi. <laughs> yeah, they, but they, they, they're, they're going to outrun in different team. ways, right? They're going to have a different value proposition. They're going to excel right. at different components within that. I so, think that's right. I think so, that's so right. I think my issue isn't really with the the fact it's happening. Maybe it's more with the article itself and how it defined it as a space race or yeah. an arms race of. Yeah, it did seem over dramatized. But this was such a big thing that everybody's like yeah. chasing. It. I didn't remember yeah. being something. By, by, by the way, it's, I mean, left. even in the space race, two different countries. Countries made it interesting. Yeah. I'm just saying, yeah. like, allegedly, the market, allegedly, and there's the market leader, but yeah, yeah. 
One last point, by the way, just on the whole Waze thing, just for a quick second. What is funny is I actually do use Google Maps um, when I drive if I'm staying relatively local. Because what is funny is um, I live in this kind of rural area. There's not a lot of people out here and the like, right? We have a fairly low population density. Waze is actually terrible here in the very local area because it doesn't get enough data. Yeah. Google Maps actually has better data mm. locally. Mm. Once I get to one of the big freeways, then Waze is much better. Yeah, but I literally, when I, when Waze Waze first started, I was driving on, along, along the little dots where it was just a blank map, and as you drove, you literally were giving Waze the <laughs> information from where you drove. I mean, that's how far. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, that's funny. I so really Tim, if you want to know more about you and where to find you, where do they go, sir? Uh, timpeter.com. Thank you, you Mr. Guys Tim. Uh, and have, I've got have a fantastic too, evening. We'll see you. Uh, I'll see you week after next. All right. Yeah, we're gonna have cat yeah. uh, next week. Sorry, we'll miss you, but have a happy Thanksgiving with the family. Happy everybody. Thanksgiving, everybody. Bye now. To Bye both of you. Mr. Hey, Stewart, I got to change you, your yeah. profile. I got to add in the wonderful distinction of uh, CHDM. Um, oh yeah. The, uh, That's right. Yeah. Got, you know, you know <laughs> yeah. put that down now. <laughs> I, was, I was really surprisingly nervous. That's the first test I've probably taken since college. And um, I, I went into that really not knowing. And I read through, you know, I read through, I skimmed the 160 plus page prep thing. And I was like, like 80% of this is common sense. But how much are they, knowing that Lauren was involved at some point, there's going to be questions in there that I was anticipating. And fortunately, new but it was like which of these was released by google in 2017 was it penguin or panda or hummingbird or amp pages and so there was like a lot of that little just you had to have specific knowledge of it wasn't a common sense thing but yeah yeah, i i just rolled the dice and said i'll take it and if i don't get it i'll you know i'll take it it. it's it's fine and so there's a couple couple questions that are flat out wrong all right so yeah let me ask you this lily there's one question and i don't remember the specific options but i think it was um this right writing adding a blog to your website is really good for, and it was A, search engine optimization, B, uh, social media, C, paid advertising, or D, none of the above. So how would you answer that? Adding a blog to your website is great for what? Well, my initial thought would be SEO. Right, mine too. No, it was social media. I'm yeah, like, well, that's a wrong answer. It's, it that, is a that, that is very debatable, isn't it? I mean, exactly. does, social, does a blog help you with social? Probably, because then you have content to distribute. But you can't say that it's more important for social than it is for SEO. Is so, that sure. the way that they're going after it for social, that they're saying then you can share your blog posts on social media? Well, Actually, to, to, to put the dots to all together for, and I think this is where the, the, whoever created that question, which was not me, um, was going after is that any page strategy has to have an organic component of referral. You're, an ad isn't the entire context of the offer. The ad is the big button you push to get to the content. To get them to the content, yeah. 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 So sure. if you're referring to an aspect or content of a, an event or a value proposition or a property explanation or offer, you always should have organic content that is connected to that ad campaign. Yeah. Blogs are the fastest, easiest way of building them rather than building pages or, or orphan pages or anything. Blogs is the easiest sure. way of doing it. But that's that's probably where they were trying to go for. But well, actually, you know, yeah. social, same thing. Your social context doesn't necessarily hold the entire content of the di- of the dialogue. It's a referral to the content that's elsewhere, which is usually on your yeah. blog. So, yeah. So I don't say that to, to dog on C- the CHDM because I think it's an amazing, you know, acc- accreditation. I think it does a good job for folks that are looking to, to you know, make some moves in the industry and just just have some authority. And HSMI in general is a, is a great organization. Uh, there, there is I'm part of the marketing advisory um, board and there's a subcommittee, a task force focused on the chdm which holly is is involved in there's a number of others too but they're reviewing all the material right now and they continue yeah. to review all the, the the actual questions i think the new book comes out sometime in may this year um so it's always evolving as as we know this industry oh, yeah. is so i don't i don't really i'm not saying that to to you know point out the flaws in the it's system really cool. everyone should should still take the chdm or whatever discipline you're in you should take the hsmi certification and before i go i do want to plug as well um the the 
digital, well, it's not digital, the marketing strategy conference that HSMAI puts on is coming up in January. So I think everyone that's in this industry, anyone watching the show should certainly take a look at that. The agenda is shaping up really nicely. They got some phenomenal speakers on that. So go check you know out. You know when they're going to release that? Um, there was an email went out this past week that had some of the, the main speakers on it. And I think they're solidifying over the next couple of weeks. Certainly by the beginning of December, they should have the final, all the breakouts. And I know they've got six or seven locked down and they're in negotiations with the others. So I would say early December, they'll have the full agenda ready to go. But from what I've seen from an inside perspective, it looks stronger than ever. So it's it's a really good one day conference. And HSMI is trying to expand this a little more to beyond just the conference because obviously the Adrian Awards and Gala is, is the day before. It, and then um, they have a couple of breakout sessions there's like a chief um, digital officer in a resorts roundtable session either way. So they're trying to really expand this beyond just the one day conference. But even if you can just go to New York for the one day, just to the conference, it's amazing. You should definitely check the it out. The networking itself. This is one of those yeah. conferences where the networking value is the highest. It is probably the one conference in our industry that, and you know, other uh, focus right aside, you know, if you're trying to hobnob with uh, those kind of people. Yeah, uh, this is for the real doers, the rubber meets the road people, the the ones that are, are facing the, the. It's a very great peer group to be yeah, talking to about the revenue marketing symbiotic relationship. The how do you facilitate this stuff? Not just talk the the value, but actually the the process of doing. It's a yeah. real good conference for that. Plus, also if you show up, you can go get a beer with uh, Stuart and I. So you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll both be there. I think it's Tim and Robert are both going to be there. I would I'm assume sure Holly's going to be, yeah. gonna be there. I know. So yeah, yeah it's, it's I'm still waiting for my speaker invitation. <laughs> <laughs> actually, it's, it's one that I mean. It, it's a little late probably too because they're probably chasing them down, but it is always one to solicit participation in. It really is. I mean, yeah. uh, I've just, I've steered away from it from having done it for so many years where it's like, I'm much rather, I, I do the live coverage. We do the live coverage outside the room. So we pull people off the stage and, and debrief them uh, yeah. from their presentations and stuff. And then uh, there's been a couple of years now that I have not literally been able to actually attend the conference by watching it. I've, I've lived it by taking them off stage and hearing about it afterwards and not even being in the room. So I don't get to be that geek in the front asking questions like I used to as much. So. You're always that geek in the front of the room. <laughs> yeah, that's true, too. Yeah. I, I really have to run. I'm five minutes I late agree. to a meeting downstairs. But um, thank right. you. Well, thank you very much. Check okay. out fueltravel.com slash podcast. You can do more go. of our ramblings. See you guys. Yeah. Excellent yeah. podcast. Award winning. Adrian. Oh, yeah. The, 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 all right. Adrian Gold. Adrian Award winning podcast. Fuel right. podcast. Yeah. See you guys. Yeah. Bye. All right. Bye, Stuart. <laughs> well, we have a little bit of time for you. So, want to hit the, the Google. I mean, there really sure. there some great articles to it, but I think Google bears some conversation to it because it does affect uh, a lot of what we've been talking about. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. we actually. Yeah, pretty much the article, and I'll, put, I'll post it up, but, but the, the sense of the article is that everything passes through Google. OTAs, right. everything. Google is the, the, the wellspring where all of this stuff comes through and for, and for, and you have to play by their rules by the very fact that they are compressing where you actually get to show up now. And uh, with mobile being the dominant internet, it is the internet now, if it, at well over 56% of all traffic coming from, I think now the newest estimate is 61, but I, I, I didn't get that from Google. I got that actually from the news presentation. Um, with that being the case, you have to get down to almost eight screens <laughs> before you get to organic results because of the helpfulness that Google has put in their ad, their monetization. And you know, a lot of times you don't get down to the organic because Google's getting better at giving you the immediate visual information that you need. And, and I'm referring to the map that they're referring to that when you see the map, you see the prices in the little balloons, you stop because it's answering two primary questions for you from proximity to what you have to know you are going to, and relative price associated with it, period. Right. I mean, that's, to be honest, that's the only way that I pick hotels, unless for some odd reason, which doesn't happen in my travel life very often, other than maybe vacations, um, that I need to be at a specific point. Typically, I'm going to go to a conference. I'm going wherever. Mm -hmm. I, I don't even Google hotels. I Google the location of where I need to be, and then I do hotels nearby, and I look at proximity, and I don't just look at miles. I look at whether or not I have to cross a highway. Is this walkable? Am I going to Uber? Like, what am I going to do? How does this factor into the total price of my trip? So all of that comes into play for me because I can see the prices by distance. And at that point, 
I'm not super loyal to any particular hotel brand. So I'm going to stay at whatever hotel is most convenient to my location. And Google, I've tried to do it, honestly, on the Expedia map, and I find it difficult. So the Google map is much, much easier for me to use um, when I want to be close to something. And I'm, I'm curious what the average traveler does, because here's where a focus group of one becomes a problem. I'm going to pick my hotel and then I'm going to click that handy little website button. I don't even look at the offers unless they're a lot higher than what I want it to be. Then I might check and see if they're at a parity somewhere and if they're, they'll match it. But as a revenue manager, I'm always going to go book direct. Mm-hmm. Unless there's, they really give me a reason not to. Right. So, well, I mean, you know, this is where we talked about that unicorn thing of being better at it. Right, right now, the default is current dates. Right. And you know that you're not, well, not to say knowing, it's very rare that you're looking at it literally because you have to go tomorrow, okay? You're usually looking at it in lead times yeah. uh, or like for booking windows, you know. Uh, <laughs> and and so because of that, um, Google, being Gmail and so forth, is going to get smarter as they already have be slowly become on other things, that they're going to know why you're looking in that location and are going to assumptively take the dates from what they think you're looking for, like a conference agenda or whatever, and they're going to insert them in. And they might even get better as to the map locations and anything related to offers associated with the conference or whatever. They might bring all that in too eventually. But, you know, right that now... It would be you're... hard, though, I think, if I'm just Googling an address for the, the convention center. How would they know which convention I'm going to? Again, it goes back to whether you have an email. Every, right. If you use Gmail and if that data is in there, because already now you have the ability. I mean, you, you can take any of your hotels and you, if you have a membership or loyalty reward program, you can actually connect your confirmation of your reservation in Gmail. You can actually yeah. connect the fact that Gmail, when you send an email to your guests into their Gmail uh, account, that they only have to click a button to confirm the reservation. Well, it's an unpopular opinion, but I really hate Gmail, so I will never be able to. to See, it goes back to this, you know, which is this way, which is that way kind of thing. I went into the the, the, the whole Gmail boat because of G Suite for business. I just like, you know, Gmail's it. And so I'm all Google. I don't even use my uh, iPhone mail uh, app for mail. I use my Google um, uh, icon to to open up mail for. Uh, and that's its choice. I used to be, you know, before I got into Apple, it was all uh, Outlook. You know, it was all Microsoft right. Outlook that I used. You know, it's, it's it, it, back in the day when there was Excel versus Lotus. You know, uh, I learned on I learned on Excel, so Lotus was always different. And, you know, I have to say that, you know, that's probably the reason why Excel lived and Lotus died was that Microsoft was good to get it out as fast as it could, faster than Lotus, people buying Lotus. And Lotus got expensive, so people started using Excel. And people just got used to Excel better than Lotus. But Lotus had some really cool functions, you know, that you wish Excel had. And eventually it did. But, you know, anyway. Um, but to that end, that's it depends on the platform of usability as to how much access to data that they have. Mm-hmm. You know, like I said, if, if you wanted to, you could connect to that. Your Gmail could be your process of confirmation for your flights. For your, You know, airlines already do that. I already, my Gmail, I can confirm my flight via just email. We say, so, yep, got it, boom, and confirm the flight right from the email that gets sent to, to, to say you're able to check in. Yeah. Um, so, you know, th- those are there. But the, the G-Squeeze thing, um, it, when it comes to showing up, this goes to the BERT conversation. Um, and for those who may not know, BERT, is a AI infusion into um, how Google looks at your content on your website. One interesting glimmer of happiness to this, which it may be temporary, is TripAdvisor, Expedia, all lost re- uh, relevancy and, and, and ranking in SERP engine pages, search engine result pages, with BERT's introduction because they don't have depth of content. They have what's called shallow content. It's a, ne- it's a lattice network of connectivities that they have content relevant to just about every location in the world, your hotels and in particular and everything else, but they don't have depth of content associated with your hotel as much as you do. So in strange ways, they're actually, their rankings associated with a lot of more specific relevant content pieces about hotels and destinations went down. And we've, you know, you use, you, you go and you look at places and you see TripAdvisor, Expedia, Hotels.com, Booking.com. I mean, it's like, it's, that's that, you have to get past that list of, of, of organics before you even get to your hotel, even though it's your hotel that I was looking for. Um, so that's an interesting twist that Bert is looking like, um, uh, what Tim pointed out, Java. And, you know, it understands your intent of the usage of the word in the context of your, of your search. 
that it knows I'm looking for the actual island and not a cup of coffee because I was referring to hotels in Java. You know, so that's one thing that it's happening with it. So what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think it's really just interesting across the board. First of all, as much as it can be annoying from a web development standpoint, and of course that affects us too with our company websites, but we're constantly having to change things and, and pay to have developers change things. But I think that the quality is really improving because of the changes that Google is doing. And so as a also a consumer of websites, I appreciate the fact that the content is more relevant or more timely and that we're not still in the era where at the bottom of every page there was something that said keywords and then there were 50 words following that to get ranked on Google. Um, Oftentimes I would do a search and the first whole page was completely irrelevant to my search. So from a consumer perspective, it's definitely consumer centric what they're doing, I think, from a Google's perspective. And that's a great thing. And it's up to us to meet the challenges. I I guess I lean more towards that side than the inconvenience of having to change anything with my website because I probably use it more of the time as a consumer. And I can, and I can redesign my website. It's fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that's, that's actually a lesson to be learned for everyone is that, and I have this from a client relationship on a persistent basis. Um, I have a website. We're good. No. You have a platform that is an ever flux and, 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 and then trying to describe to them the need for persistent content improvement, refinement and changes. Um, you need to actually, and this isn't just to generate revenue from a consulting point of view or an agency point of view or whatever, your website needs to flex with where and when and what business it's doing. It's no longer a central gateway, one doorway entrance in your homepage and then goes from there. Every page in your website is an entry point now based on the content relevance of that page. And so every page has to have some symbiont as to what you are in, co- in total context in addition to the specific content that drove the traffic there to begin with. Um, and it goes to something as simple as, as the seasons change, so too do, should your graphics. So right. should your context. So should be what you're talking about, you know, uh, in, in, in content development and so forth. And you just can't rely on the fact that because you talked about fall last year, as well as that page may have been indexed and found that you're going to get that same traffic relevance because somebody else generated content and relevance about the same topic and you're not it. And so you've lost traffic and it changes just because you ranked well on this one word doesn't mean you keep it the next day. You might not even show up in the top 10. If you do it, you have to know what everybody else is doing too. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, And it's not necessarily the hotel across the street. It's right. literally, it could be another destination that's, you know, I, I, I think I've told this story before too, is that I had hot- hotels in Key West that I was constantly in competition with Vail, Colorado. And they're completely disparagingly different. And that's the point. Biffy and Buffy were trying to decide whether they want a beach or slopes. And, right. and, and so, you know, uh, they were constantly trying to go for the same darn graphics I was going for. And so they were looking at, you know, what choices they were trying to make for it. So understanding that, knowing who you're competing with in that market, you could steal some of their interest over to your side as well because they were trying to steal yours. So right. it is a constant, uh, you just don't tie your, I always say when you're driving a car, you just don't tie the steering wheel off no matter how straight the road. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's what your website is. You constantly have to make minor corrections over things and make minor changes over time so that it stays exactly where you want it to be. So yeah, exactly. now that we've solved the universal world problems for that, there's a whole mess of articles we didn't get to touch that we could just probably shotgun through some of the ones because they were fun enough. Um, we'll just go from the top of what we didn't do. Uh, the first one was Marriott plans to inject color into Bay Sheraton's. It won't be easy. Um, what, oh, they're redesigning Sheraton again? Huh? They're redesigning Sheraton again. They're trying to. Well, I mean, they're trying to make sure that the corpse stays somehow alive. I think they're trying to make a zombie walk, but that's just me. Um, I think it's, but they have too many of them. Time I mean, in ten years between Starwood and Marriott that Sheraton has gotten a brand redesign. Well, there's so many of them. It was the default brand that if you couldn't qualify for the others, we made you a four point. <laughs> right. You know? I mean, but, but you know, it's like funny the- because they just went from you know they had the kind of like cherry wood look, right? Then they changed to everything has to be navy blue. And they made everybody change all their collateral, change their lobbies, change everything. Now they're going to be doing that again. If I were an owner of a Sheraton, 
I'd be pissed. Like you're, you're killing my CapEx just to change your brand. Mm -hmm. So from that perspective, I can only imagine that there's a lot of frustration and that this could alienate some Sheraton owners. Um, I, I, I agree that it needs to be done. I just feel badly for owners who've already gone through a couple of re reiterations of Sheraton that are now going to have to reinvest all over again. Yeah. Well, and also too, there, there's always brand saturation issues already. And Sheraton isn't the poster child of uh, prioritization for the brand that owns them. And so you're sitting in a market that you were, used to be competitors for the hotel across the street, AK Marriott, whatever. And now you're frenemies. And now you have to share data and share con, you know, because obviously as a brand, a branded hotel, it's not your data, it's the brand's data. And, you know, at some point, as you said, the owners have to say, go, you know what? I think if I just take the flag off and go with whatever look I think is best for my market and invest that where I'm not being told persistently, my brand value proposition contribution is not there anymore. It's just not there. So rather yeah. than this brand saturation issues that I'm fighting, let me be myself in my own market. And I get to go over and point out that I am, in fact, the closer hotel to the airport rather than having to give that duty to uh, a brand that is in preference to mine, you know, on and on and on. So, yeah, I think there, there's to your point, there's going to be a lot of brand owners that are going to say, yeah, I'm tossing in the towel. We're not going to do this anymore. And I know of a lot of ownerships that are deflagging, not right. necessarily surgeons per se, but in general, deflagging. And if anybody needs to know whether or not that's a profitable move for them, they can reach us at tcrmservices.com. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, to, to your earlier point, Barack Obama says he likes Hampton Inn. I love the point that he made. It's like, hey, I love the presidential suites. Don't get me wrong, but I don't like taking 15 minutes to shut up all the hidden light switches. Uh, sometimes just having the bed in the one location, the bathroom in the other, and the door in the other is all good. And I have to say, that sometimes simplicity and straightforwardness, I'm, uh, it depends on the type of travel, obviously. Uh, if I'm doing it for recreational purposes, I think I like the poshness. But if I'm doing it for business, it's a function. I just need to be somewhere. And I want the room to be functional. I want it to clean. I don't want the little uh, sanitized uh, <laughs> remote. Yeah. Reminder. Yeah. I just want it clean. You know, I mean, we, we all do our rituals when we go into hotel rooms of what we wipe down, what we check out to make sure that before we go to bed that there's nothing else in there and stuff. Uh, but, yeah, I, I think it was a great point that he made that, hey, sometimes simplicity wins. Um Let's see, booking, holdings, experience. Uh, we talked about that one. Hospitality stays. Uh, race to bottom, got that one. We didn't really hit too much on the subscription scheme. And since I have you, how do you feel about the membership thing? Like, hey, we can do all this stuff, but hey, if you sign up with us in a membership capacity, a paid for membership capacity, not just a sign up to sign up, but if you pay a little extra now, we can really reward you with exclusivities in the future, including some sort of value proposition first trip. I mean, I think that this is great to get around to parity issues, because if they're paying for a membership, then it no longer is apples to apples. So this is something that I've always told hotel owners, if you're dealing with a site that offers a subscription, which this is not the first, Mr. and Mrs. Smith or Smith Hotels has been out there for a long time offering a paid subscription. Mm -hmm. uh, and the the value to that is that then you can offer something that's maybe not in parity if you wish to. Um, another really interesting one that just came up with one of my clients is Inspirado. Have you heard of that? Yes. Mm -hmm. So paying basically a monthly fee and then you never pay the hotel rate. They take care of that for you from what I understand. So there's a couple different ways you could go about it. Um, but the subscription model is really interesting to me. And I'm curious to see if more people will go for it or if it will come back to this consumer choice idea where then they feel limited to only hotels that are displaying. Like Smith Hotels is very choosy about what hotels they bring in, which yeah. kudos to them. You know, it's luxury. They oh, and things like that. They yeah. inspect the hotel, you know, so that's great. But also if I want to stay at a Holiday Inn Express that's close to the airport real quick so that I can get on a 6 a.m. flight, that option is not available to me within right. the subscription. So you kind of have to do a, a value analysis for yourself as a traveler to say, am I, am I comfortable being limited to whatever's within this subscription? And does that pan out for me? I mean, heck, I even do that with Sam's club. You mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. is, is the cost of this membership not only going to pay for itself, but also give me the benefit that I now have to shop at more than one store. Right. Well, and the same thing of you know, Costco and so forth where, you know, yeah. 
you make the money back that you paid to be a member, but you also made more money. That, I mean, the rent a cars with well, I, I don't I only rent cars from Costco now. Hands down, the cheapest place yeah. I ever can rent a car from. Um, but to your point, it, 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 the, the, the tough part is the, the exclusion aspect of it. And, and I'm trying to figure out how a, a single hotel can play this. Um, destination, obviously, uh, I, I think you have to have enough of amenity base to make a value proposition. You can't be a limited service or just a restricted service property. Um, unless you are so well positioned in your market, you're so close to the conference center or the airport or something that you are the default value proposition of staying there because it is the convenience factor of exactly what you're there for. Right. Um, I think that, that it would have to have that kind of criteria base to it, but, to your point, I always thought that, you know, when you go into these free memberships, you get what you pay for. And yeah. a bottle of water after me being in your hotel for 30 nights is not exactly a, you know, a really great reward. And and always it's it's patterned and, you know, we call it a frequency program, not a loyalty program, because it's patterned after you have to stay beyond the normal frequency to get the real value propositions. And so it's never quite attainable. Airlines are the magic at that. You know, the mileage necessary to get to your next level is always past a usual business travel person's norm, where you either want to pay the money to get the upgrade or you want to take a uh, frivolous travel flight to make sure that you can hit that mark. And nowadays it's like, no, I'll just use your credit card and I get almost the same benefits, you know, yeah. uh, and just go that route. So. Um, yeah, I, I think membership, it has a value to your point from a rate strategy point of view. It's an excellent tool at that point for non-parity. I mean, the, then you can really create a value proposition for somebody uh, that goes beyond just their frequency value. So, yeah, I yeah. think it's a good one for that. Um, let's see. Da, 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 the Google schools. We talked about J.D. Power, travel industry apps. Apps and website lag behind our industries. Yeah, that's a no, no brainer. It's like, duh. Yeah, we know that we're slow about our travel. You know, people we have better apps than the travel industry. We knew that. Um, again, group business, C event, uh, projects, challenging us group business market. We've had this discussion, but I don't think we've had it with you. You know, uh, like I said, I have clients in New York, New York, international travel is down by almost 44%. Uh, whether it's the perception of the U S economy or the perception of who runs it, whatever, uh, and international travels down, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, international travels have to be fingerprinted and pictured is, is annoying. I mean, in reverse, when I've traveled abroad, uh, I always thought it was like, what? You want my picture? And what? what? You know, so just picture that in reverse when people show up in the United States and they got to get their picture and fingerprints and all this stuff. You feel like a criminal just walking into the country. Right. Uh, so, you know, international travel is down. Uh, group business. Uh, we do more of this online now for most of the mainstream dialogues of stuff. I know firsthand from uh, sponsoring and pr promoting HSMI conferences and so forth that a lot of companies are not funding uh, conference attendance. Uh, they're relying upon their third-party vendors to educate and inform them, which I think is a dangerous thing to do because uh, it's a biased opinion at best. So um, what do you think? You know, do, do you see this as a perpetual continuation or this just as a current cir circumstance and situation? Gosh, it's so hard to say. <laughs> so hard to say for sure on that. You know, it's just it could go either way. But I, I think you know, I see a lot of different opinions on group business right now. I've actually seen recently a lot of articles where it said that group business was up, forecasted to be up, and now there's one saying it's forecasted to be down. Um, I would liken that to, you know, are, is the cholesterol and eggs bad for you or good for you? <laughs> There's probably an article. Yeah, which which year you're asking, right? Exactly. You know, the year that they said exactly. it was bad or the year they said it was good for you? Yeah. So, you know, we've been making a concerted effort to reach out to all of our clients um, in this quarter and talk to them about what they're seeing for 2020 so that we can best position, you know, what we need to do to help them win in profitability in 2020. So one thing that really stood out to me was just the comment that it really just matters where you're starting from. And I think that that's going to be true no matter the case. I mean, if you've had an average group outlook and you have recently added a ton of group sellers um, and you're really hitting it with prospecting, then you may have a different result than the hotel down the street. You may be stealing share I will say that the latest CVB forecasts that I've seen, most of them are, are projecting higher convention group 
uh, business for 2020. So unless those actually pull backwards like they did in 2009, and I don't think we're there right now, um, then I think that there is a lot of places where group business is actually up. So given that this is coming from Cvent specifically, mm. I would assume that it's actually both more broad and less broad, right? So yeah. you've got your convention center groups, you've got your Cvent groups, and you've got your direct groups. And I think all three of them maybe are performing differently, hence the confusion in some of these group forecasts. Yeah. Well, and again, I think in previous discussions with the rest of the gang that we point out that there's a regionality to that interpretation as well. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some markets, Nashville, oh, heck no, that, that group business is blown out of the water. That's, you know, the, what they're doing is massive. They've turned into a major powerhouse when it comes to group business. Um, you know, up in the likes of Chicago, Orlando, and Las Vegas, even. I mean, they're they're just blowing up. They don't have the full spectrum of the the square footage for conference usabilities and so forth, but they are definitely as as, as equal caliber to Minneapolis or some places like that, uh, in the sense of, of anchor points. I mean, every time I go to Nashville, the skyline's different. There's 16 cranes in the air at any time, building up high rise buildings. Those areas in Nashville that you wouldn't walk to at night that are now, you know, uh, metrosexual little suburbs. You know, it's like. How'd that happen? When that happened, you know, it's just, it's crazy, the change in the city. So there is a regionality to that. Um, to that end, no, no strange thing here. Smith Travel downgrades his red par growth projections. Duh, they do it every year at the later end. So does everybody else. It's nothing against them personally. They over, uh, they keep their stockholders happy at the beginning of the year. And then they give them a little bit of reality by the end of the year. Okay. I tell us to that to owners all the time too. Yeah, right. All um, the time. So on this line, one of the, one of the couple of last ones here, Acor, uh, Acor Hotels uh, a subsidiary leaks a terabyte of data. I have a question for you, and I was going to ask the other gang, and they didn't get to this. When you check into the hotel and you have to show your ID and so forth, and oftentimes or not, they make a copy of it. Do you ever ask for that copy back? No. But I, it, I usually find that they aren't making copies anymore. I heard a rumor that it's actually no longer legal to make copies of IDs, but I'm not sure how accurate that is. But typically, they don't need a copy of the ID. The only time I usually still see that in use is if the guest is paying cash. Yeah. It is, I don't know about the legalities. I agree with you. I don't know if, if by state by state if there's the legalities associated with it. But I have always made it a point, and this is for my, my wife's persistence, that uh, we well, you get the copy back. Just, okay, hey, you know, if you know that they've made a copy or if there was a possibility of a copy, you at least ask them, did you make a copy of my ID? Oh, yeah, it's, you know, it's on file. Yeah, I know. Mm. I mean, you don't need that any longer. I proved who I was. We've completed the transaction. I've paid. I want my ID back, you know, basically. And, and uh, uh, it, it just little things like that, because you look at the, there is nobody that's completely safe from being hacked. Just and there isn't, right. you know, and this data, I mean, Macy's just talked about the fact that there that there were a lot of payment data that was stolen from them, too. So, you know, people, you shop at Macy's, it's like, great. You know, now there's another one to worry about. Um, I will say, though, that not many people are saying that their paper copy of their ID was stolen out of the dumpster. No, but I will tell you a story of what I used to do. <laughs> As a food and beverage director at a hotel in, in uh, Houston, there was a new hotel that was built right behind us. Our loading docks faced it. And uh, all of my group business, my food and group business, just started drying up because everybody wanted to try the new kid in town. Okay. So I'm out back in the dock with my, my team, and they were smoking, and I'm looking over, and I see across the street and dumping papers into their bin. So I walk over after the person walked away and I looked in and picked up the paper and it's BEOs, banquet event orders. And it goes, you know, banquet event orders, it's full contact information and everything else like this. I'm like, hmm. So I noticed there was a lot of my previous clients on there and so forth and so on. So I just grabbed what I could, most all of it, and went in and started calling them, but this goes back a few years. And hey, Mr. Smith, I noticed that uh, you, you know, this is Lauren at the you know, hotel, blah, 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 that you were one, uh, across the street at the, the, the hotel and you had a wonderful chicken dinner, so forth and so on. I said, I'd love to have you back. I can do it for $2 less a head because I had the price. <laughs> this went on for a while until I got Did a call from the community. <laughs> Did this freak them out? No, no, I was very, very courteous about it. They, you know, some of it asked, well, how do you know that? So, oh, we saw you guys walking in, you know, we're right across the street. We can't miss it, you know, and it flattered them that we would actually remember who they are, which we, you know. Um, so uh, my GM called me up after doing this for a few weeks. He says, Lauren, are you taking BEOs out of the blah, blah, blah's dumpster? Well, not anymore, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I'll spare a lot of business. It's like, hey, you know what? If you're not shredding 
And that goes back to a little bit of what I say is like, you, you know, you, we had a news thing down here, I guess some sort of um, doctor's office, something or other, or somebody maliciously, whatever, dumped a whole file cabinet of medical records on the side of the road, just papers everywhere. And this was, you know, medical records, you know, the, the histories and all this other stuff that just got thrown out. And it was a big deal because it's like nobody was cleaning up, no was taking responsibility for it. There was no record of where it came from or anything like that. But that kind of stuff, you know, how 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 well do you know that that hotel, you know, once they're done with your copy, should they have made one, just didn't throw it into the dumpster, you know? And somebody <laughs> came along, and go, oh look, IDs, you know. I wouldn't use it for that purpose, but you know that kind of stuff. So it's one of those things, just like you know, the the, the idea that anything can be taken from anybody or there's a hack that's being done somewhere. It's just you got to walk around like that. Um, yeah. Again, just to finish off on some of the articles, the Ambridge interstate merger was a very quick transition. I mean, four months right. is pretty remarkable for companies of that scale to have blended so fastly. But when you read well, the article, they didn't blend. No, no, no. They're still in the process of blending. I, I Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Um, I have some uh, insider data. I can't share all of it, but I will say that the merger in terms of resources and things like that is very much still ongoing. So perhaps they merge their financials or something along those lines, but for sure they're still deciding, you know, what the best um, the best setup is and all of that. I did notice that Davidson's new COO came from Interstate, so it's mm-hmm. interesting. That was just announced very, very recently. So I think that we're going to see maybe a little bit more of that because just like when two roads merged and then even more so when Hyatt acquired two roads, there's Mm -hmm. just, they might not need everybody. And so Mm -hmm. I think there's some people jumping ship, others will be politely escorted. Um, Mm -hmm. I think both, you know, the companies are both really great. I've always felt that they dealt really ethically from everything that I've seen. So um, my hope is that they're taking good care of their people in the process of the merger. And it's still good to see that they're moving so quickly. I, I will say also that it was probably very quick because there is likely no change to systems here. It's not like the Marriott Starwood merger where we're talking about massive technological changes to PMS, CRS, RMS systems. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they're already on brand systems. They're just a management company. They're not rolling out their own proprietary systems with the exception of maybe finance. So that definitely makes the merger a lot faster. Sure. I mean, right now, the reporting system is probably their biggest uh, beast to tackle as to who right. gets what information and what collaboration and so forth. But yeah, to your point, I, I did a presentation not too long ago on how to survive a merger. And unfortunately, the best recommendation I could give as advice to most people was be loud. Because it's the quiet ones that get left behind Um, when it comes to, you know, you can have uh, advocates for you that say, oh, you know, Lauren did a great job. He's been always great in the X, Y, Z position. But the other side, your mirror of who, and it also depends on who's taking over whom in this world, who bought whom, okay, as to who gets preference to who gets to choose. Uh, But sometimes just the other person being louder or more vocal or more engaged or whatever. And that goes from reaching out immediately across the aisle to the other side saying, hey, I'm Lauren. Um, I work, do this and this and this with them. I'm looking forward to looking with you guys. Who wouldn't one of you guys does what? So I'll be talking to you. And you just literally step in and do the assumptive of, hey, I'm doing this. And so now that we're doing this together, I'm going to be doing this with you. I'm not trying to squish the other person, but the louder person tends to get the squeaky wheel gets the attention right. kind of thing. And so when people are sitting down looking at lists going, you know, Lord really took an initiative and, and, you know, he reached across and I, I like working with him. And I mean, I like, you know, my, my person, but you know, Lauren seems to be the person that really is taking this on, you know, so let's yeah. keep moving. And the other person goes bye-bye. And make sure your results are apparent as well. Yes. yes. Conversation. It's, so that it's not just who do you like, but also, you know, make sure that you're quietly making sure that they have access to, key things that you've done that had moved your company forward mm-hmm. so and, and the best results too. Yeah. And one of the strongest ways of doing that is answer questions quickly. Mm-hmm. Don't try to be elusive. Don't try to be, Oh, right. uh, like, Hey, I'm open table here. We're to help. We're one team. Uh, you know, the you more know, you, I, I did a study on that about a year ago and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. 
It's exactly. a great way, you know, in being able to promote other things that you've done in the past that maybe aren't even relevant right now. But, you know, back then it was this, but the most recent data tells me this. Conversations like that immediately bring people to your side because they mm-hmm. can see, you know exactly what, what's going on and that you have a grasp on it. And if you don't, if you have no clue what you're doing and you haven't made any contributions to your company in the last two years, you should probably start job searching. Yeah, you should be like, I, I'm going to be the one that gets taken away and given the little brown box saying thanks right. for your service. Um, but yeah, it, it's very much that. And also, too, uh, being complimentary in the sense of those people that are coming into the team, whether you're the one that was bought or the one that is buying. But if you're that person that says, now that we have you as this resource, now that we can do this or I can give you this as a, something that can augment yours, you start showing the connect the dots and people are like, wow, you know, this person immediately is, is looking at it from the bigger picture. They're, they're already looking at it right. from the way we have to look at it. And the to... culture is a pit. Yeah. You know, yeah. some people may choose to leave just because the merged culture is going in a direction that they don't personally believe in. And I right. really applaud the people who leave for that reason. Mm-hmm. Not because it's anything antagonistic, but because they have a strong sense of what their personal values are. And they know whether or not they align with the brand. And if they don't, then find a brand that they do align with. There, uh, there's all sorts of value systems out there with brands, right. and you have to believe in what you're doing. So if you don't and you're just struggling to hold on to a job, just keep in mind there's a lot of open positions out there right now in hospitality with this growth in supply. A lot of positions are in short supply. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that everybody's going to be pretty much fine as long as they're being proactive and looking ahead for whichever path it is that they prefer to stay on. And to your point, with the with the idea that it's not a cultural fit for you, you have a wonderful reason of why you're looking. Right. You know, the stigma of being removed because of merger or the stigma of looking for a new job. For You know, here you get to say, look, you know, these companies came together and it wasn't because of it was just the, the blending was not of a culture that I was enjoying. And I'm looking for the culture that fits for me. I, I thrive and excel in a culture that I feel committed to. And that was not a culture that I saw in the direction that I wanted. And and people can understand that. And they appreciate that they're that you're looking at them as if it's their culture that, that you're looking for. So it's it's it helps in a lot of ways. The last comment was the rut row. We'll finish the rut row. Um, the Sinners Hotel. I guess, you know, I don't – Robert put this in. I don't know why. No, well, actually, I don't <laughs> it. Um, but I'll put the article up real quick. Um, so this hotel is trying to be this discreet uh, boudoir kind of thing. And, and why not Paris, right? Um, I missed the word discreet in there. Was that in there somewhere? No, I don't think so. I think I just kind of put it in there by the way they were describing the, the decorum. Um, but they fail in the service world. I mean, the, the people seem – happy to help but the, the actual infrastructure of the hotel the, the amenities are not diverse enough or big enough or there's there's uh, functionality issues that are problems so i guess the telltale tale of this is if you're going to try to first garner attention by calling yourself the center hotel um that you should have all the accruements associated with making it a successful concept and not miss the mark on some probably fundamental things like the uh, do not disturb button not working <laughs> yeah, that's a problem for this hotel. Yeah, yeah, the spa only holding two people, but it's a hotel that has more than two people in it. So, you know, if you're going to use the spa for spying, I think you don't want to share with 50 other people or 52 of them, whatever. But yeah, so I guess from a concept point of view, if you're going to put a concept or a theme to what you're doing, work through the details first and make right. sure that they're all in place before you uh, open up and have somebody point out the fact that you're not quite what you think you are. <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, this goes to literally everybody. I think there's a lot of people out there who just kind of, oh, this sounds great. Let's just do it. And they just don't take the time to think through all of the details. And so I think that that's, that's problematic across the board. They just happen to be a little bit more straightforward. But what's interesting to me about it is the unabashed concept that they have behind this that's really catering to a subculture that whether or not we want to talk about it is out there and Mm -hmm. i guarantee that half the people who don't want to talk about it wish they could be part of it to be completely honest so i think that it's really interesting that they're going this route i think they have to be even more careful with data you know i go back several years to the whole ashley madison thing that Mm -hmm. broke where, you know, it's really a site for affairs. And then when they got their data leaked, that was mm-hmm. a whole 
different kind of problem. That was a whole best. So, <laughs> I think, you know, a hotel like this is kind of looking at a similar thing. You know, people don't want to to admit to their proclivities in public. And so I'm really curious since they're making this so public that whether or not there will be any hotels that follow suit on similar concepts or, well, you know, will, will the concept spread at all or not really? I don't know. You know, you, you have your historical uh, back in the roadside hotel days, the honeymoon suites, you yeah. know, uh, this kind of thing. I know from a client I had in Australia for a long time, QT Hotels with Ridges, um, they had this really lead edge nouveau feel. They had these uh, uh, beautiful women that were bellmen, you know, basically uh, called Mavens of Mayhem or something. They nicknamed them and were these provocative things. But they 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 were they were huffing the luggage. I mean, they were you know bringing the luggage over. They, they, that was a position. They did great at the job, but their whole you know, upside down bicycles on the on the ceiling things and odd things there in the rooms and sheepskins in the rooms, seriously. But that's an Australian thing. Um, <laughs> but, you know, and the, the one cool part that was in the hotel was if you were in the elevator by yourself, they would, we, they would put a sensor in the, in the elevator. And so the song that was playing was, one is the loneliest number. If it was two or something, it's like there was other songs depending on how many people were in the elevator. You know, so it had really cool little things like that. I don't think they went the whole naughty, you know, as in Paris kind of thing, but they certainly were of that provocateur thing that, this is this is cutty edge nouveau. You got to be chic to be here mentality. Right. And there's, there's a lot of hotels out there. Like, so yeah, I think there's there's possibilities of it being, you know, uh, niched like that, depending upon how much um, density to market you have. I mean, this is a, a hotel of one, you know, yeah. that's doing this in Paris. But when you mentally put Paris and romance, and you know, mentally it all goes together. So you know, it's it a good place to to start. Yeah. Uh, which doesn't bode well for New York, I guess. But oh well. Um, I have kept you here a really long time. Thank you. Uh, two, okay. two, two hours and 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, actually, I, I really did. I really enjoyed Robert's list this week. He really put together a lot of good stuff. And uh, the pleasure of having you from a revenue perspective is it's a lot of fun. Thank you. As you come into the conversation. So I always enjoy the fact that we can make sure that those conversations get brought up. Um, next week, we will have uh, Katya Mohammed, or actually known as Kat. Uh, she's brilliant. Uh, she's uh, the uh, director of education for AHOA, the Asian uh, Association of Hotel Ownerships. Um, I was just at their HX conference. Well, actually, it's not their HX. They, they merged uh, uh, in sponsorship with the HX conference, which is a hotel experience conference in New York, uh, which is tied to the uh, designers conference, which was amazing. A uh, huge place. 67,000 people attended kind of thing. Wow. Uh, but she's the director of their education. And um, it, she picked this date. I, I, I told her, you know, pick a date. And she, she says, well, I'll do the one right after Thanksgiving. And I know it's hard for get, uh, other hosts on this because it's a holiday. Um, but she is bringing a great topic. And I am told her automatically she has to come back again. Uh, yeah. You can't just let this go once. And this is human trafficking. And, and, and I'm not saying this from a, you know, we're going to talk about the, uh, our industry has never truly been educated in how it contributes to human trafficking. And so we need to train our teams to identify what human trafficking is going through their doors. And it's going through our hotel doors. There's no hotels that can say, oh, no, that's not a problem for us. Any hotel can be an unwilling participant in human trafficking. You do not know. You do not know who was left in the car while the person checks in. You do not know that quiet person standing beside the person that's checking in. You do not know who was let in after the person checked in or the fact that they brought somebody in outside by a website or something. You do not know. Now, High security hotels maybe have a better chance, but they may. We, we contribute to this this terrible crisis right. as an industry, we, willing, you know, unwillingly. So she uh, has developed an education program for Alhoa. Uh, she went through a certification program with an uh, organization that has identified this and is, is out to train people in industries to identify uh, uh, human trafficking to stop it. So I think it's a really excellent topic. And I, I, I give her oh, as any time you know, when you came to any guest as much time as I want to talk about, but I think it's an incredibly valuable topic to bring in. Um, and I told her, you know, regardless of how much we get covered in this show next week, she's got to come back another week so we can all participate in that conversation again yeah. too. So, um, yeah. So I, I think you mentioned that you're not going to be able to make it. I didn't know. I oh, know I'll be there. 
Oh, you will. Oh, awesome. Yeah. I'll mention it. Too, so it might be like this. It might just be the two of us from what I'm hearing, but uh, I'm okay. Yeah. That's Holly says she's going to try to make it as well. Okay, uh, great. And so that'd be something. And I, I, don't, I haven't heard from Stephanie yet. It, it would be it. an interesting change if it was all women. You know what? And now I will be happy to uh, blank my screen on if I have to, or be the token <laughs> man in this conversation. But uh, yeah, I, I think it, I can't overemphasize the need for this topic in this conversation. Absolutely. I truly, truly think it's value. So uh, with that said, for anybody that wants to uh, know more about you and what is it that you do, where can they find you and what is it that you do so that they know? Sure. So I'm the CEO of Total Customized Revenue Management and a founding partner of ThinkUp Enterprises, which you can Google to read more about in Hotel Management Magazine. And uh, we do revenue management services for the industry. On the TCRM side, we do task force or long-term engagements where we're handling the day-to-day -day revenue management. And ThinkUp Enterprises is our newly branded consulting arm in which we're focusing in on the important topics of assessing your sales, marketing, and revenue management efforts within your hotel to improve your profitability and create sustainable legacies for your company. That's a lot. Um, <laughs> uh, for those who saw earlier in the show, we had Tim Peter from Tim Peter Associates. We had Stuart Butler from Fuel Travel. Uh, we had um, uh, Robert Cole with Rock Cheetah. Um, who we didn't have was Holly Zoba from Influencer Sales. She's a regular Stephanie Smith with Cogwheel Marketing. Um, did I miss anybody? Dan Waxman with Asacito, uh Valley Perrin with uh, Nor One. These are other co-hosts that we have that come in and out with us all, um, which always gives us great diversity for this show and all previous 223 other shows. You can go to hospital for now. You can go to hospitalitydigitalmarketing.com forward slash live. Um, by the end of this month, I think um, – I'm, uh, we'll be finally able to put the new website up. I'm, I'm, right now, the domain I'm thinking of using is hospitalitylifeshow.com. I don't know if I'm really hooked on that yet. Uh, if you talk to, oh, Edward Sanders with Flip2 is another co-host that didn't make it today for us, but is a regular for us. Um, everyone's into this brevity of domain names, and I've never been a subscriber of that. I've always felt you should be what you are. Uh, it helps with the process of knowing what the website for. I say that from experience of being a partner in an old agency called Standing Dog. It's like, what? What was that? You were drunk one night and you came up with a name, which literally actually probably happened. Um, so, you know, it could be the relevancy of the domain name. And now with Bert and things like this going into the context of, context of, of uh, what the words mean, I think it actually helps in the process if your domain is rel related to uh, what the content is as well. But so right now it's hospitality live show, uh, dot com is what I'm thinking is going to be. It might be something different, but we'll see. Um, but we'll also be on a new platform, which will allow for 10 talking heads uh, in December. So that'll give us a little bit more flexibility with uh, having even more people who interrupt each other and talk over each other. I might have to, I might have to might start using the mute button on some just, right. you know, Robert click. Yeah. <laughs> Me, click. Anyways, so for everyone that watched this, we were simulcasting today on um, four different LinkedIn's, four different Facebooks, two different YouTubes, and one Twitter. Um, so hopefully for those that watched us through any of those, uh, this show will also be recasted next week uh, for EU, the European Union, uh, London time at 11.30 on Wednesday, and APAC, Sydney time, 11.30, uh, Sydney, um, uh, Melbourne time. So with that... Thank you very much, Lou, for all of your time today and your contribution to the conversation. And for everyone, uh, thank you so much. And we will see you all next week, 1130 Eastern, when we have Kat Muhammad talk a lot about education that Aho is doing. Till then, bye, everybody. <laughs>